Good morning and welcome to the first Science Committee hearing of the 118th Congress. We're leading off with a discussion of how we can strategically improve U.S. scientific competitiveness and address the threats we face from the Chinese Communist Party. This is one of the most important challenges facing us at the moment, and I expect that global scientific leadership and competition with China will be a thread that runs through much of our upcoming work. There are two reasons for that. First, America's economic strength, national security, and our quality of life are all fundamentally dependent on our ongoing scientific progress. In fact, more than 60% of America's economic growth in the last century is due to advances in science and technology. U.S. public investment in R&D adds nearly $200 billion in economic value, and basic research in particular increases long-term productivity across multiple industries. The second reason for our focus on this topic, beyond our own economic benefits, is the threat that we face from the Chinese Communist Party. The CCP is determined to overtake us as the global leader in science and technology. They're outspending us, outpublishing us, outeducating us when it comes to STEM PhD graduates. What's even more concerning is that they're working to steal the results of our research and innovations, whether that's through cyber attacks, forced intellectual property acquisition, or malicious recruitment initiatives like the Thousand Talents program. I want to be very clear about the consequences of allowing the Chinese Communist Party to become the world leader in science and technology. It means fewer opportunities for American companies to compete in the global economy. It means increased risk to sensitive national security tools. And it means that critical technologies like artificial intelligence, quantum information sciences, and cybersecurity tools will be shaped by and embedded with the CCP's values. If the CCC, CCP becomes the global leader in scientific discoveries and technology development, we should expect less privacy, less transparency, less access, and less fairness in how these systems operate. So we cannot afford to lose this competition. When I first became ranking member of the committee in 2019, finding a way to address this challenge became one of my first tasks. That led to the introduction of the Securing American Leadership in Science and Technology Act in 2020, comprehensive legislation to double down on our investment in basic research and develop a national strategy for scientific development. With SALSTA as a blueprint, our committee began to develop bipartisan legislation to advance America's scientific and technological capacities. There were a number of bumps along the road, but two years later, Many of those ideas we first laid out in 2020 were passed into science as a part of the CHIPS and Science Act. When I talk about that bill, I want to point out that while funding for CHIPS production is going to build factories today, it's the science portion of the legislation that will be the engine of America's economic development for decades to come. Central to all of the investments and modernizations in the CHIPS and Science Act was the creation of a national science and technology strategy. We directed the Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSTP, to develop a comprehensive strategy for America's science and technological development every four years. That strategy ensures a comprehensive, whole-of-government approach to research and development. Improving coordination between federal agencies and a more strategic approach to prioritizing our resources. The national strategy will ensure that our time, energy, and funding for federal research and development will be focused on the most important challenges facing our country. And given the increased funding we're giving to federal R&D, this strategy is necessary to maximize the return on investments and make good use of taxpayer dollars. Today's hearing should serve a few purposes. First, to give us an overview of the current R&D enterprise. Second, to examine the scope of the threat the CCP poses to our scientific leadership. And finally, to consider how best to develop a national science and technology strategy. I expect the topics we discuss today to inform much of the work we'll do over the next year. From reauthorizing NASA, to expanding our domestic drone industry, to strengthening American clean energy technology. While there are significant challenges ahead of us, I'm very optimistic about our ability to face them 
and ensure that America continues to have a thriving scientific enterprise. In the past four years, we have worked together in a deliberate, transparent, and bipartisan manner to pass meaningful legislation supporting American science and technology. Our goal is to continue that tradition in this Congress, and I'm looking forward to getting to work starting now. And with that, I turn to my colleague for any opening comments that she would make. Uh, you. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Lucas, for holding today's hearing. Thank you to our distinguished panel of witnesses. Ranking Member Lofgren regrets that she is unable to be here today. She was very much looking forward to this hearing, and in particular to discussing the critical importance of investing in fusion technology. And I ask unanimous consent to add her statement to the record. Seeing no objections, ordered. Thank you. Uh, for more than 70 years, the United States has been the unquestioned global leader in science, technology, and innovation. Reaping the benefits of, to our economic and national security and overall quality of life. This leadership was built on the vision and political will of our leaders in the aftermath of World War II. They enacted the National Defense Education Act, created the National Science Foundation and NASA, and made other unprecedented investments in our nation's talent and technology. Over time, however, we became complacent and our commitment to non-defense R&D waned. At the same time, much of our manufacturing capacity went offshore, making our supply chains vulnerable and risking our economic and national security. Our insufficient commitment to research and domestic manufacturing left an opening for other countries and they seized it. China and Europe increased their investments in critical technologies and emulated our innovation systems in building theirs. Last year, the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology took a significant step to reinvigorate the UN Science and Technology Enterprise with the Bipartisan Chips and Science Act. And thank you, Mr. Lucas, for emphasizing the and science part of that bill. Uh, this law is already starting to bring good paying manufacturing jobs back to the United States and it's accelerating the development of future industries across our country. In fact, today the Commerce Department is announcing the first application for CHIPS funding, specifically for manufacturing facilities, so we can start to invest in domestic companies and their workers and incentivize innovation and production in America. Because of the CHIPS Act, Intel, which has its research facilities in the district I'm honored to represent in Oregon, has committed to investing $20 billion in two new leading edge semiconductor fabrication facilities. A key provision of the CHIPS and Science Act requires the White House to conduct a quadrennial science and technology review and develop a national science and technology strategy. This provides us with a tremendous opportunity, an opportunity to have a coherent, all of government approach to our investments in science and technology that will grow U.S. leadership, bolster our competitiveness, and safeguard national security. As several of the witnesses noted in their testimony, to achieve these goals, we must think broadly about who is at the table to inform the strategy. We must solicit and welcome the input of the private sector, communities that have historically been left out of setting research agendas, and everyone in between. Inclusion in setting the agenda is essential to the responsible development of technology that benefits all Americans and leaves no issue and no American behind. As the witness testimony makes clear, innovation is key. We need creative, critical thinkers around the table, people who can come up with new ways to view challenges and inventive ways to solve problems. As a member of the Education and Workforce Committee and co-chair of the STEAM Caucus, I advocate for the integration of arts and design into traditional STEM fields, which inspires creativity and increases the competitiveness and diversity of the workforce. The national strategy is also an opportunity for us to reimagine how we can integrate the goal of a circular economy, a new model of manufacturing and consumption that focuses on long-term sustainable growth across our research agenda and lead in the responsible development of technology. Through our S&T strategy, we can leverage scientific investments to tackle our greatest challenges. With the climate crisis threatening the nation and the globe, we can invest in sustainable solutions to mitigate and adapt. The circular economy does not just apply to the energy sector and transportation, it applies to chemicals, materials, food production, manufacturing, and more. I urge OSTP to keep up all of the issues discussed in this here to keep all of the issues discussed in this hearing as in mind as they begin to develop a national science and technology strategy. 
I look forward to hearing more from our witnesses today and to discussing how this important strategy can best serve our nation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back my time. The gentlelady yields back her time. I would like to thank our witnesses for joining us this morning for this important discussion. Dr. Kevin Dogelmeyer is the former director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and currently the Regents Professor of Meteorology and Weather News Chair Emeritus and the Rogers and Sherry Teagan Presidential Professor at the University of Oklahoma. He co-founded and directed one of the National Science Foundation's first science and technology centers and served as Vice Chairman of the National Science Board. Thank you for being here. Ms. Deborah Wentz Smith is the President and CEO of the Council on Competitiveness, a coalition of leaders from industry, academia, and our national laboratory directors committed to driving U.S. competitiveness. She has more than 20 years of experience as a government official, which includes serving as the first Senate confirmed Assistant Secretary for the Technology Policy at the Department of Commerce. And Dr. Kim Bludell is the Director of the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory which is responsible for ensuring the safety, security, and reliability of the nuclear stockpile. The doctor has three decades of experience at LLNL, where she has used her background in applied science and engineering to advance science and improve our national security. Thank you, too, for joining us. And lastly, we have Dr. Cologne, Mr. Cologne Kitchen from the American Enterprise Institute. Mr. Kitchen analyzes the interaction of national security and defense technologies and innovation. He focuses on technologies of the future like cybersecurity, national intelligence, robotics, and quantum sciences. Thank you all as witnesses for being here today and sharing your expertise. And with that, uh, Dr. Dugamar, we will turn to you first for your testimony. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, and thank you so much for the privilege of testifying. Uh, we send our best wishes to uh, Ranking Member Lofgren and uh, Congressman Von Amici. It's great to see you. Thank you for your long service here on this important committee. Uh, thank you all for the support of science and technology that you render to our nation. I just want to say the comments that I'm going to make this morning really reflect my own comments and not those of my home institution. Uh, as the chairman said, our extraordinary leadership, our global leadership in science technology is being challenged as never before. And numerous studies bear this out, and he cited many statistics. You know, we became a global leader for many reasons, but two of them stand out, and I really want to highlight them for you. First and foremost, we became a global leader because of our values and our freedoms. The freedom to discover and create, the freedom to debate, to challenge one another, the freedom to speak freely, freedom to share, a free market system where we can take our ideas and develop new private companies and develop capabilities for the benefit of humanity, and most importantly, the freedom to pursue our own pathways and our own dreams. Now, interestingly, these very freedoms and, and, and values are congruent with the very values by which we actually conduct research, namely honesty, integrity, reciprocity, accountability, impartiality, objectivity, the ability to really rigorously debate and then do so with great civility and also merit-based competition. In a world where clearly values and freedoms, like I just mentioned, are not universally treasured and reinforced, and where authoritarian regimes seek to undermine longstanding norms and international order, we as the United States must maintain our global leadership position in science technology, not only by virtue of our contributions, but also by leading with our values. We also became a global leader in US science technology which includes government, academia, and for-profit and private companies because of this wonderful ecosystem. It's very important that the national S&T strategy be structured as what I call a whole of nation plan involving, as Congresswoman Bonamici said, all sectors of our S&T enterprise in a very integrated manner so that everyone that looks at that plan, whatever sector they're in, they see themselves in that plan, all the way from the beginning, all the way through execution. Our national S&T strategy should be like no other. It should be absolutely bold and transformative and disruptively creative in our work and guiding us into the future. It should unite us and inspire us by the bold ideas it put forward. It should streamline administrative procedures and structures that tend to hamper our work and tie our own hands, empowering all of our scholars and researchers to unleash their full creative capabilities. Most importantly, in this strategy, we need to leave politics behind. And I think this committee is a great example of that. We have to begin with a set of guiding principles in which all S&T sectors and political parties can agree. And I believe OSTP's current leadership is exceptionally qualified to lead in this effort. Now, a four-year S&T strategy is fantastic, and I absolutely support that idea, but I think it needs to be constructed within a longer-term framework, what I call kind of a 25-year horizon or arc 
that does not identify specific technologies or research areas of investment, but rather it describes in very broad strokes a U.S. vision for its future in terms of research and education and technology, domestic and international partnerships, and also national and international norms of behavior. By taking such a long-haul view, which is exactly what the Chinese government does, they don't think the next election cycle, the next four years, they think the next 20 years. By doing that, I think we will, for the first time perhaps since World War II, as Congresswoman Bonamici said, we will have the chance to have a multi-decadal multi national context within which will reside this important four-year strategic plan. Now, obviously, we cannot underestimate the importance of human capital to the future of our S&T enterprise. I personally believe that we need a, stat a, a national STEM workforce and talent initiative, similar in many respects to the GI Bill, which would leverage and in many cases supplant a lot of the individual workforce initiatives that are out there. What I'm saying is we have a lot of flowers growing. We've got thousands of flowers growing, but we need to plant some beautiful lush gardens that we tend and that we really think of in a national context. This S&T strategy is also beautifully positioned, and I thank Congress for that, to provide a very bold vision for moving forward to a skills-based education and workforce environment, where an assemblage of demonstrated skills and capabilities, not just degrees, is the coin of the realm. We also need to safeguard our science and technology, and I know we'll talk about today. We face new and ever-growing challenges and threats of foreign interference in our S&T enterprise. Now, numerous activities are underway to address these threats, including many things at academic institutions. Safeguarding our research is actually another wonderful opportunity for us in the U.S. to lead with our values, to welcome foreign collaborators who may not be familiar with the kinds of ethical conduct and research based on where they actually developed their skills and were educated, but we have that here in the U.S., and we can help ensure that their behavior and the behavior of everyone in our enterprise, whether it's from Norman, Oklahoma, where I'm from, or Beijing, China, everyone plays by the rules. Everyone adheres to the rules, and we uphold the highest professional standards of ethical contact. And finally, and perhaps very importantly, being a global leader in science technology means we don't play to not lose. We cannot depend upon a growing international S&T enterprise, which is a good thing and is lifting all boats, we can't rely on that to lift our boat as well as everyone else's. With this national S&T strategy that you, Congress, have challenged us to develop, and I think we are ready to do this, it could have a very, very strong and powerfully unique game plan for the future, that is, we in America can, leading with our values, working with the international community, and investing wisely and boldly to ensure that we remain, our ship remains, the highest ship on the seas. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I look forward to questions. Thank you, Doctor. And Ms. Wint-Smith, you are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Lucas, Congressman Bonamici, members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to testify at this critical hearing on the U.S. science and technology enterprise, <clears throat> competition with China, and the need for a coordinated national science and technology strategy. The Council on Competitiveness National Commission on Innovation and Competitiveness Frontiers <clears throat> comprises some 70 leaders across academia, industry, labor, and our national labs to really address these generational challenges facing our nature, nation in order to drive our productivity, our standard of living, and our leadership in the world. To define the myriad competitiveness challenging our nation and abroad, we've developed very actionable policy recommendations for the government and the private sector, and I want to share some of those with you today as they clearly have informed the very seminal legislation that has been passed for our nation and the future. We know that <clears throat> we have entered a new age of innovation. It's defined by the convergence of these exponential disruptive technologies that are not only reshaping industries, but really will determine the geopolitical and national security strength of nations. Everything from the emergence of quantum platforms and autonomy, biofabrication, clearly precision agriculture, the list goes on, and the critical underlying importance of next generation semiconductors and beyond lithium batteries. While the U.S. is capitalizing on these unprecedented opportunities, we face so many major challenges in our enterprise from the decline in basic research investment, fewer Americans engaged in STEM and starting new businesses, Long-standing barriers in the commercialization of the technologies that we invented here in America. China has stated its ambition to supplant the U.S. as the world's technological leader and become the dominant economic, military, geopolitical power to shape the foundation, the standards, and the rules 
of the new age of innovation. If the U.S. fails to make the sustained large-scale investments in all our people, infrastructure writ large, we will not only stall economic growth, continue low productivity, fail to create the high-value jobs of the future, solve societal and environmental problems, and very importantly, we will erode our geopolitical leadership, seriously damage our national security capabilities and power. As noted, China's leaders openly state their long-term goal to supplant the U.S., including as the global leader of democracy and freedom. China's state-driven strategy is fundamentally different from that of the Cold War era or the economic and industrial rise of Japan. And China is walking the talk, making massive investments in every strategic technology, as well as using, as we've heard from Chairman Lucas, the tools of intellectual property theft and aggressive cybersecurity attacks against our companies and our government. China has targeted the entire semiconductor supply chain, as well as the batteries. Let's not forget that in the current generation of lithium batteries, 90% of the graphite is controlled and comes from China. They are aggressively acquiring U.S. tech startups and companies outside the jurisdiction of CFIUS. So of five recommendations I want to share quickly. One is that we do need new mechanisms for federal coordination at the cabinet level. And we have called for a White House National Competitiveness and Innovation Council on the same par as the NSC and the Economic Policy Council. We are calling for expanding and investing in place-based innovation to develop a fully utilized, untapped potential of talent in our country and upskilling a workforce and forging the public-private investments and partnerships throughout our country, not just in the metropolitan cities and coast lines. We must integrate economic development and workforce development in the innovation hubs that are really possible for our nation. Three, we must embrace technology statecraft. That means working closely with our allies and partners in these critical technologies and doing so in a way that advances our shared interests as well as expands trade, the global mm -hmm. rules of trade, transparency, and ensuring more people in the world can participate in the benefits. And then, of course, we must scale and deploy our technology. We still have the proverbial valley of death. We need new financing models. Traditional venture capital will not get us where we need to be in dealing with next generation semiconductors, batteries, and I know we're going to hear about laser energy fusion. In closing, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, we strongly support the full funding for the science components of the CHIPS Plus Act legislation. And I look forward to coming back soon as we have recommendations from the second phase of this national commission, which is being launched at the University of California in Davis. And I must say I'm very proud that Director Kim Budell is a commissioner working with the council on developing the strategy for our nation's future. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Dr. Budell, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Lucas. Congresswoman Bonamici, I'd like to extend my regards and thanks also to Congresswoman Lofgren for her long-term partnership and support, and committee members. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify today and for the committee's commitment to ensuring U.S. scientific and technical leadership. I'm the director of the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, a Department of Energy National Nuclear Security Administration lab, dedicated to applying leading edge science and technology to address the most important security challenges facing the nation and the world. I also chair the National Laboratory Directors Council, where I represent colleagues from across the DOE, which is home to 17 national laboratories, again, three of which are overseen by the NNSA, Lawrence Livermore, Los Alamos, and Sandia National Laboratories. These labs are home to many unique scientific tools, and we work across the full spectrum, from fundamental discovery science, often in partnership with academia, to applied science and technology for ultimate transfer to industry for deployment. Together, these world-class national labs are strong contributors to and enablers of U.S. leadership in science and technology. On December 5th, researchers at the National Ignition Facility at LLNL achieved fusion ignition in the laboratory for the first time in history. <clears throat> this achievement was six decades in the making. 
as we consider U.S. innovation ecosystem today, it's reasonable to ask, what made this work? Ignition is a remarkable scientific advance, but it's also a triumph of sustained and patient support for research from Congress. This enduring support has made the DOE National Laboratory System the envy of the world due to its world-class workforce and formidable scientific capabilities. Fusion Ignition also demonstrates to the world our nation's capabilities and, importantly, ensures that the U.S. has the best people and ideas to bring to bear on the important challenges that we face as a nation. The Ignition story also highlights the important role that the national labs play in the U.S. S&T ecosystem. Chartered as federally funded research and development centers, the national labs have enduring missions and are well positioned to foster collaborations with academia, industry, and international partners to tackle the biggest, most important challenges. The National Labs are skilled at bringing together multidisciplinary teams and expert in designing and building state-of-the-art, large-scale scientific facilities, often unique in the world. The National Ignition Facility was built as a centerpiece facility for the Stockpile Stewardship Program, for which it has made highly impactful contributions in ensuring the safety, security, and reliability of our nation's nuclear deterrent. NIF has enabled fundamental discoveries as well, ranging from novel material properties to astrophysical phenomena, and decades of research on lasers and optics have led to remarkable advances. For example, National Lab R&D led to extreme ultraviolet lithography that has enabled production of microchips that power the newest iPhones, and adaptive optics technologies that dramatically enhance the capabilities of ground-based telescopes. The National Lab environment creates opportunities for innovations not always foreseen that serve the U.S. extremely well. So what does the future hold? I have high confidence that the Lawrence Livermore team and collaborators can continue to increase fusion yields, which are needed for our national security mission, as well as potential energy applications. To advance inertial confinement fusion for energy, we need to create new kinds of partnerships. And several of my fellow witnesses have commented on the importance of uh, creating a vibrant partnership ecosystem Without significant public support for fusion energy research, the labs will not be able to build partnerships to support a rapidly growing private sector fusion energy enterprise with vitally needed unique facilities, capabilities, and expertise. And as of last tally, there was about $5 billion in private capital being put into fusion energy companies across the many approaches. Uh, without robust public sector uh, investment, that, re that capital will not realize the potential that it represents. I'm often asked what the timeline is for fusion energy on the grid, but perhaps a better question is what will it take to make that timeline short enough to meet the urgent need for this technology? With that, I look forward to your questions and thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Absolutely, Doc. And then we now turn to Mr. Kitchen for five minutes. Chairman Lucas, Congresswoman Bonamici, thank you for the opportunity to testify before the committee. The United States science and technology enterprise is strong and continues to be the envy of the world. American companies are pioneering and deploying innovations and in technology that can expand human thriving, broaden economic prosperity, and ensure the national security for generations to come. But to do these things, we must deliberately address three key challenges to the American science and technology enterprise. First, we must confront Chinese technological theft and aggression. Beijing, like Washington, understands that emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, advanced robotics, and quantum science will decisively shape tomorrow's societies, economies, and battlefields, and that these innovations are overwhelmingly being developed in the private sector. But unlike the United States, the People's Republic of China is not committed to free and fair competition in global innovation. Instead, the Chinese Communist Party is co-opting its innovation industry and using it as an extension of the state for traditional and economic espionage that FBI Director Christopher Wray has said surpasses every other nation combined and represents one of the largest transfers of wealth in human history. Whether through social media companies like TikTok, drone companies like DJI and Autel, or smart device companies like Tuya, the U.S. science and innovation enterprise, which spans the public and private sectors, is hemorrhaging data and intellectual property and will be left emaciated if these losses are not stopped. Second, 
We must help our allies understand that a strategy of regulate first and ask questions later will hurt, not help, all of us and risk ceding the advantage to Beijing. Other governments, particularly those in the European Union, are enacting laws that deliberately target American innovation companies, that preference their domestic champions, and that threaten to splinter the internet itself into a series of mini nets, each running on incompatible infrastructure and governed by contradictory rules. Even more, the economic scarcity that would inevitably flow from such a splintering would leave these partners more susceptible to the siren song of cheap cloud services and other offerings from China, which are heavily subsidized by the CCP, as previously discussed, for the express purpose of stealing a country's data and wealth. If this happens, many of our friends will have lost their sovereignty and security in their bids to keep them. Finally, domestic debates about technology and innovation must be constrained by facts and geopolitical realities. Every institution and industry must be held accountable to US law and national securities concerns cannot be wantonly employed as a get out of jail free card. Neither, however, should perceived but unsubstantiated political grievances be used to justify counterproductive or even unconstitutional actions against the very science and technology enterprise at the heart of our individual and national prosperity. Pushing the frontiers of science and pioneering game-changing technologies is expensive. The resources and talent to do these things are highly valuable and desperately scarce. It is no coincidence that the companies that have found ways to attract billions of customers and the profits that come with them are the same companies at the center of our science and technology enterprise. They innovate at scale because they operate at scale. Instead of railing against these companies because of their size, we instead should be thankful that our free market economy has produced an alignment of interests where private sector actors can generate wealth and jobs while also developing the capabilities that will provide for the common defense. This uniquely American advantage may well be decisive in an era of escalating geopolitical competition. It would be reckless to give it away. There is much more that I could say on these matters, but I'll end my remarks there. Thank you again for this opportunity, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, and thank you to the entire panel for some very insightful uh, thoughts and observations. We'll now turn to the question uh, session of the hearing, and I'll begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, Dr. Dogermeyer, in your testimony, you speak to how our democratic values and freedoms, freedom to discover and create, freedom to debate, challenge, speak freely, are the bedrock of the American research enterprise. Can you please elaborate on what makes the U.S. S&T network of government, academia, and industry unique, and how these values contribute to our competitive advantage? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I think Mr. Kitchen just uh, beautifully laid out uh, the important part of that argument. I think the thing about uh, the interlocking nature of the four-sector enterprise, academia, industry, nonprofits, and the federal government, uh, is the fact that there's a symbiosis. In fact, if you look at FFRDCs, of which Dr. Budell leads one, these federally funded research and development centers, the federal government does not run Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. A contractor runs it. The federal government does not run a, a, any FFRDC that I'm aware of. Basically, it, uh, it has contractors operate. So it keeps an arm's length. That is just the opposite of what China does. As we just heard Mr. Kitchen talk about, China is deeply enmeshed in, <clears throat> in the business of, of innovation and development, and they basically make the choices of what is going to be done. They direct the work to be done. That's not the case here. I think it's also uh, certainly true that <clears throat> we have um, government labs and centers that do their own intramural research as well. But one of the most important things I think ultimately, and I think everyone can speak to this, is the fact that there's a lot of open and freedom, openness and freedom to create, create new ideas and things like that. In fact, what, what happens in China, China tells the industries what they're going to do. Here, Congress listens 
holds hearings, and we hear the federal agencies responding to what the community says we need to do. The, the National Ignition Facility was not something that Congress said, hey, we need an NIF, we need to do it. It was the researchers, the scientists in the community. So the fact that we have this four-sector enterprise, it's not perfect, it's kind of clunky at times, but it works exceptionally well because the government does its role, but they leave to the scientific and the research community the rest of the, the uh, uh, you know, decision making and what the priorities ought to be and where the innovation actually happens. That freedom is something that is super attractive and it's one of the most important attributes that we have as a nation uh, to wield against China in, in what it seeks to do in terms of global dominance. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Wentz Smith, what are the benefits of having a national science and technology strategy? And while you're thinking about what are the key characteristics of such a strategy that will ensure that it's adopted and utilized by the entire U.S. SNT enterprise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, first of all, I think it gives us the opportunity to have a unified vision. We're hearing, you know, very important parts of that in this hearing and articulated by the members. But right now we have a splintered system. We have a lot of the economic issues that profoundly impact our science and technology enterprise being addressed in the Economic Policy Council. Huge issues such as product liability, regulation, antitrust policy being addressed in another forum. Issues around national security and technologies that are totally dual use do not often get addressed in other parts. So we really need new mechanisms at a very coordinated level, for, first for the government, to get a policy in place that addresses things from the perspective of how does this impact our economic growth, our productivity, and our national security. Those are the three outcomes, really. And then what's very important about the United States and having a national strategy is we do have the mechanisms to bring our private sector in to help shape that through advisory committees, whether they're FACAs or uh, you know, temporary. I mean, the National Science Board is a wonderful example at NSF and the Defense Science Board. But they're working on those sets of issues, not the overall strategy. So I strongly believe, as did the people working in our National Innovation Commission, that we need an entity that works on this policy that has the same stature and power, quite frankly, as the National Security Agency in the White House, I mean the National Security Policy and the other vehicles that address these domestic issues. But we need to integrate and cut across the sectors, and we're not doing that now, quite frankly. <clears throat> Mr. Kitchen, in the time I have remaining, ideally the quadrangle review process and development of a national S&T strategy would be an opportunity to reevaluate partnerships between government, academia, and industry. Uh, expand on why this is so critically needed and what outcomes we should seek for, from these partnerships, for these partnerships. Thank you, sir, for the question. <clears throat> I begin with the idea that there is no scenario under which the United States is able to secure its interests or its people absent a deep partnership with the private sector. The United States government is now a national security stakeholder, not the national security stakeholder. Beyond dependency, public, private public partnerships are our unique advantage. Government can focus and invest in core science that holds promise, but that is not mature enough for the marketplace while industry, using the dynamics of the free market system, can rapidly and efficiently create the innovations that people want and that will drive our economy forward. The academy supports both of these efforts by advancing core knowledge and by producing essential talent. It is my view that this cooperation needs to be encouraged and to be made as frictionless and mutually reinforcing as possible. Thank you. My time has expired. Chair now turns to the gentlelady from Oregon for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Lucas, and thank you to the witnesses. Uh, one place where there's a tremendous opportunity to show leadership is in confronting climate change, one of the most important challenges of our time. And as we transition to a carbon-free economy, we need groundbreaking research and advanced technologies to effectively reduce emissions. So Ms. Wynne-Smith, in your testimony, you noted that China has recently overtaken the U.S. in patents filed for nuclear fusion technologies. Do you have any sense of the relative strength and quality of China's fusion research enterprise overall in comparison to the United States? States. Thank you, um, Congresswoman. I, I do not have expertise on the Chinese capabilities in laser energy fusion. I believe Director Budell does. But what I do know is they're following the playbook of actually what Japan did some years ago, which is called patent flooding. They're, they're filing a lot of patents around these areas, hoping 
that they will then be able to fill them in with an innovation. And some of that will come from intellectual property theft and cyber attacks. So increasingly, China is using the patent system in order to steal and use technology from other countries and inventors. So that's one issue. Th thank you so much. And I'm going to follow up with Dr. Bedell. Um, in, in, of course, to follow up on Fusion First, we've heard a lot of talk from the administration uh, lately, and congratulations, of course, on the Fusion integration just a couple of months ago. What a remarkable accomplishment. And I wonder, have we seen um, the willingness to aggressively pursue and, and support the development and commercialization? Uh, and what should future investments look like to continue U.S. leadership and advance research and technology at the pace needed to achieve our goals, including climate goals? Thank you very much for the question. Um, I think there are some uh, very encouraging signs that there is very strong support for uh, building on the momentum that's been uh, achieved through science and technology advances across the fusion community in the last year. So that's both in inertial confinement fusion, which is the approach we take, and magnetic fusion energy, uh, which is uh, using tokamax, for example. Um, and there has been a lot of engagement between uh, the Department of Energy, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and the private sector to try to understand what the key questions are that remain. <coughs> of course, investment lags. This, our fusion ignition breakthrough, was in December. Uh, so we're beginning now to formulate plans for what an investment strategy would look like uh, to solve these critical problems. But across both approaches, ma materials, challenges, understanding how to operate in radiation environments, understanding how to manage the fuel for fusion reactors, tritium supply, and then recycling and management, um, understanding balance of plant issues, how to get the energy out of the system and, and right, into, right. Uh, into the grid, and for inertial fusion energy, significant challenges going from a facility that was built to do national security research, one shot, uh, high yield shot per week, <clears throat> to a 10 times per second uh, energy salient uh, ignition facility will be a very significant amount of research for which we don't currently have a substantial program in place. Thank you. Do you have sufficient workforce to do that? We do have workforce, and I will say that recruiting is, is up. Uh, in the wake of our announcement, uh, many people joined our lab to pursue this science because it's, they're very passionate about sure. it. It's incredibly difficult and challenging uh, science, but it's also uh, the potential benefits are incredibly and, galvanizing to students. To, to, to follow up on the workforce, you know, the, um, uh, the, the strategy, the, the law includes provisions to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workforce. Why are these provisions important in developing a national strategy broader than fusion? Uh, and how will including people of all backgrounds and experiences help us be competitive and support our efforts to maintain U.S. leadership? Fundamentally, excellence depends on diversity. Diversity of perspectives, diversity of ideas, diversity of backgrounds, disciplines in every dimension. So if we want to be the best in any given field, it's important that we tap into the potential of all the people who have the inclination and the aptitude to pursue these fields. I really believe that fundamentally is critically important. For science and technology fields like fusion energy, it's even more important because the number of disciplines we need to draw on is vast. The workforce that we need to generate to support this R&D agenda is very large. And so leaving people behind, uh, making assumptions about which institutions or which people should participate is a fundamental barrier to progress in these fields. At the national laboratories, we work very hard to ensure that we have broad and deep outreach programs to a wide variety of academic institutions, spanning two-year institutions where we're generating technologists and technicians that support this research through to PhD granting institutions, including partnerships with HBCUs and minority-serving institutions, uh, again, to bring along communities that have historically not been represented in the numbers uh, that they should be in these disciplines. Thank you, and I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentlelady and the gentleman from Florida, Ms. Posey, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Winsmith, in your written testimony, uh, you stated, by increasing China's profile on international standards bodies, it aims to implement the nation's China Standards 2035 blueprint and Belt and Road Initiative uh, for the next generation technology. Uh, what can Congress do, uh, particularly the House Science Committee, uh, to ensure the U.S. maintains our leadership in the international standards bodies. Thank you, Congressman. Well, standards have for many years been a non-tariff barrier. Even our colleagues in the EU have used standards as a way to protect a different 
technology or innovation path from the U.S. in adopting standards. We have, as you know, a private sector standards-driven process with various committees. Um, NIST, our National Institute for Standards and Technology, plays a role. But at the end of the day, it's the private sector committees that develop our standards. They do not have, quite frankly, the reach, the resources to participate in many of these critical standards bodies. So it's very important for us, in my opinion, to beef up the capacity of NIST and our private sector bodies to participate fully at scale, because sometimes we only send one or two people to a standards body. And you look at the international organizations. I mean, China now is, is, is poised, and they may be, the head of the, inter, uh, the IPO, the Intellectual Property Organization. Yeah. So we need to invest and hmm. populate these international groups, because the U.S. alone cannot do that. And then also it goes back to what I said about technology statecraft. We need to work with our allies and partners. UK, Australia, Japan, India increasingly, and the EU on these standards that are so critical in the technologies that determine national security. Because all of these are dual use technologies, quite frankly. Yeah, they like to play everybody's game by their rules. Uh, Mr. Drogmeyer, uh, in your written testimony, you uh, had recommendations regarding the national uh, S&T strategy and quadrennial S&T review. One recommendation uh, is the need for a skilled technical workforce. You know, I represent the Kennedy Space Center, and, and, this, and I've heard from uh, companies that the need for these highly skilled uh, technicians is, is really great. Uh, what policy changes do you believe are needed uh, to uh, help us maintain a pipeline of this kind of personnel? Well, thank you so much for asking that question, because it, it oftentimes uh, goes unnoticed that that the skilled technical workforce is really the underpinning of a lot of the science and technology development that we do. You look at large facilities like um, uh, the Large Hadron Collider. You look at the LIGO facility that had the uh, you know the first gravitational wave. Uh, sorry, there, there are people technicians who develop you know capabilities to uh, to to have very incredible vacuums and things like that to keep these facilities going. They're skilled machinists that use uh, 3D printing and other kinds of things. So they're very, very important. I think what we, we need to do, we heard an example from Dr. Bedell that, that Lawrence Livermore, in their own initiative, they reach out to two-year and technical schools to incentivize the folks to do this. And I think we need to make sure not only are we resourcing them, but we're making clear the value that they have, that this is not just sort of a second-class citizen job. If you don't have a PhD, well, it doesn't really matter. No, these folks, in many respects, are the, the underpinnings of our S&T enterprise. So we need to have programs. The National Science Foundation has one in particular uh, for the uh, skilled technical workforce, it's, a, I forget exactly the name, it's something like something, career tech education or whatever. But, but those investments are very, very important uh, across all, all disciplines to incentivize these folks coming in and showing the value that, that, that they, uh, they actually have. Uh, Ms. Swin Smith, would you repeat uh, your uh, statistic uh, that you mentioned earlier about graphite? 90% of the world's sourcing of graphite comes from China. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chairman yields back, and this time the chair recognizes Representative Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the passage of the Bipartisan Chips and Science Act was the largest investment in American industrial policy in the past 50 years. It includes vast new resources to support entrepreneurship and technology and manufacturing with an ambition of leaving no American behind. Um, but this is because many Americans have been left behind in science and technology. Uh, per U.S. Census Bureau, 90% of manufacturing firms are white-owned, 4.6% are Hispanic-owned, 4.5% are Asian-owned, and less than 1% are black-owned. Within that small fraction, those black-owned manufacturing firms are more likely to be less than three years old. CHIPS and Science Act looks to supersize scientific investment and also promises new resources and policies uh, to allow historically black colleges and universities um, and other minority serving institutions to participate equitably and genuinely in this research funding and in the entrepreneurship of wealth creation. Um, understanding that innovation can often come from small companies that large companies uh, then later buy. How can we ensure that equitable access to entrepreneurship and science and technology includes those small black businesses and other small businesses from marginalized communities? Um, Ms. Wentz-Smith. 
Th thank you for that question, Congresswoman. I think you've raised, you know, an incredibly important issue for our country because actually one of our members at the council, Michael Crow, president of Arizona State, said this, so I always give him credit. If you think of our nation as a baseball team, we're only fielding less than 10% of the players whenever we participate in the game. And so we have to, as a nation, do everything we can to bring our entire population into the innovation economy of the future. In terms of underrepresented ethnic groups, populations, one of the things I think that's very critical and it's underway is to integrate, for instance, our historically black colleges and universities into large-scale research activities. We have a number of the presidents of these institutions in the council. They have capability to come in and participate in an advanced project in quantum at another institution. That expands and builds up the capability. In terms of the small businesses, we obviously have, you know, the Small Business Administration financing, but I think that one of the gaps, again, is on this place-based innovation. I am very excited about what's going on in some of our universities. For instance, I'll mention one, South Dakota State University. I just recently learned from the president that by the time you graduate, you will have, from South Dakota, Dakota State University, all the capabilities for the top clearances to work in cybersecurity. So we need to look at all these universities and ensure that we have a path for all our citizens. And I want to just mention on the issue of the labor unions, and I was whispering this to, to Dr. Brudel, the Pipe Fitters and Plumbers Union is still at NIF. They built NIF. They operate NIF. These are highly skilled workers. And having this collaboration between our unions and our companies is very, very critical to this strategy of building out a very diverse, inclusive economy. Thank you. Um, in my home district, um, Pittsburgh, we've been turning the corner from uh, more uh, manufacturing industries, uh, steel, to a tech hub, an innovation hub. Uh, one such uh, business that we have in Pittsburgh is, is a company called Astrobotics. It's an employee-owned company uh, with the goal of making unmanned space missions feasible and more affordable uh, for science. Um, Dr. Budell, Astrobotics is, is, is actively competing with Lockheed, Elon Musk, and Jeff Bezos. Uh, space exploration and advancement of technology and science should not be limited to billionaires. So what steps do you believe we can take to ensure that organizations like Astrobotics are not outliers in science and technology? Thank you very much for the question. It's a very important one. Um, when we think about partnering with industry, we think about it in different tiers. So we commercialize technologies, meaning we spin out uh, technologies. So we work with startup companies. We work with small and medium-sized companies. We bring them to the laboratory so that they can have access in partnership with our researchers to our facilities and capabilities to help increase their capacity to compete. And then we work with large business um, as that may be appropriate to the technology that we're talking about. So we have active programs uh, in ensuring that our capabilities are well understood in the broader community and that we have mechanisms in place where we can bring small and medium-sized companies to bear. I'll cite two examples. One, we have a program for the application of high-performance computing in manufacturing and other, other areas. Uh, where companies can apply to work with our researchers to have access to our machines and our simulation tools. And a second, we have an added advanced manufacturing laboratory where we have laboratory space specifically designed to bring academic and business partners into the facility to work with our researchers again to advance their technologies and enhance their competitive prospects. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Chair now recognizes uh, Dr. Babin from behind the Pine Curtain. That's East Texas. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Bonamici, for organizing this incredibly important conversation that we're having today. I want to thank all of you witnesses for being here and taking part with your expertise. Uh, when we talk about investment in our research and technology, it's equally important to talk about how we protect it as well. Uh, it's no secret that for years the Chinese Communist Party has stolen American intelligence, technology, and intellectual property and their relentless pursuit to supersede us as the number one superpower in the world. So how do we make sure that our S&T is better protected and what should our approach be? And that is what I want to focus on today. And uh, Mr. Kitchen, 
Uh, in your written testimony, you describe the U.S. approach to the geopolitical race for technological advancement as engage and invest, uh, whereas you refer to the CCP's tactics as fuse and use. In the U.S. approach of engage and invest, the best option for our long-term completely, excuse me, is the U.S. approach of engage and invest the best option for our long-term completeness? Now, are there any lessons that we should take away from the CCP's fuse and use tactics? Thank you, sir, for the question. I think the only lesson that I would recommend from the Chinese model is that it spreads the national security burden across its public and private sector. But the CCP does this through coercion and for economic reasons as well, and we do not want to do that. What the U.S. should do, however, is forge voluntary public-private partnerships that are based on a love of country, common interests, and our shared fate. Um, American technology companies have worked very hard to gain their geo, uh, geopolitical influence, and it's now time that we help them wield that influence responsibly. Thank you very much. And one more. While China's R&D expenditures have grown exponentially, I understand that 84 percent of that nearly 500 billion R&D expenditure is on development, and only 5 percent is on basic research. How does the United States' emphasis on basic research give us an advantage in the long term to compete, to collaborate, and to thrive? Sir, I think the key point here is that China essentially crowdsources their R&D by stealing the IP and data of other nations and then spends the bulk of their time and resources on turning this stolen treasure into capabilities. Um, basic research is exactly that. Uh, it is the foundation on which everything else rests. And if we do not continue to replenish that basic research, our innovation will grind to a halt a little bit like expecting your car to run forever because you filled the gas tank last week. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Drogemeyer, uh, I was pleased to have worked with this committee on getting one of my bills, H.R. 3747, included in the CHIPS Plus bill that passed last year. My bill will establish a pilot program to ensure the security of federally supported research data and to assist regional institutions of higher education and their researchers in safeguarding our sensitive information. You mentioned in your testimony how the CHIPS Plus bill provides the opportunity to compete against China. Can you please elaborate on that and how we can simultaneously protect our S&T research? Well, thank you so much for the question. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like the record to show that Oki is having a good conversation with a Texan here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. We appreciate that, too. It, it's very, very important. It's noted in the record. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, it's a very, very important question. It's the balance between protect and promote. And I think the key thing in terms of the protect side is to make sure that we have the capability for our institutions, whether large or small, to have the resources they need to, to vet the individuals and, and companies and others that they're working with. You, you want to make sure if you're a bank and you're giving a loan to somebody, you want to know what their background is. You want to know their capability to repay. We don't do, I think, a good enough job to do that. We need to make sure we know who we're working with. The fact that they arrive on our campuses doesn't mean that they don't have uh, un, you know, undue influence on our, on our system. So we need to educate. We need to provide resources. Uh, in the CHIPS Act, uh, the National Science Foundation was charged with standing up uh, a research security information sharing and analysis organization. NSF is in the process of doing that now because universities and colleges aren't equipped to um, you know, answer the kinds of questions that that type of facility will, will be able to answer. So I think we need to educate, we need to train, we need to create vigilance, but we also need to promote our values. And folks that come here from other countries, we need to, we need to uh, model those values and talk about the consequences for not adhering to those values. And when we all play by the rules and they see the importance of that, because I think most people long to play by the rules, there are some bad actors out there, you know, but I think those are the kinds of things we need to do to balance the protection of our, of our research assets with promoting them. And the last thing we want to do is have China say boo and we jump and tie our own hands. Right. That's exactly the wrong approach. Absolutely. Thank you. I have one more question, but I'm out of time, so I will yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. I appreciate it. We now uh, represent, represent, uh, represent, recognize Representative Ross for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing and to the ranking member, and thank you to all the panelists for joining us. 
I'm delighted to be holding this important hearing today because last Congress, I worked with my colleague, Congressman Waltz, um, who previously sat on this committee, to pass the National Science and Technology Strategy Act. And it was signed into law, as you know, as part of the Chips and Science Act. This legislation created the whole of government planning process for research and development, ensuring better coordination between federal agencies and a more strategic approach to US research and development goals. It also requires the president to submit a report to Congress on national research priorities and activities as well as global trends in science and technology including potential threats to the US scientific research and leadership. I represent part of the research triangle in North Carolina, which is a hub of innovation, and it's home to some of the world's top research universities and institutions. Collaboration between public and private entities to advance American research and innovation is a top priority for me, and I look forward to hearing from all of you about that. I do want to pick up on one of the comments that was made earlier, though, about um, technical workers and the work that we need to advance all of the great STEM innovation that we're having. And I'm pleased to say that the head of the National Science Foundation came to North Carolina right before Thanksgiving and spent more time at our Technical Community College than he did at our greatest uh, NSF receiving grant institution. Now, of course, I represent them both, so I was happy for him to be at both places. But as we know, these workers don't need to just have four-year degrees. And in North Carolina, particularly in Wake County, we have a pretty sophisticated community college that has gotten three NSF grants. But not every community college has the ability to do that. And um, we, we do know that there is more technical assistance to our community colleges. But if you could elaborate on how we should really reach out and embrace our community colleges that will be preparing these workers, per perhaps by targeting locations where we know we're going to need those workers for um, strategic purposes, perhaps partnering with our four-year institutions. And I'll just open it up to all of our esteemed panelists for any suggestions that you might have and how we can help advance that in this next Congress. Yes, please. <laughs> I'll start. Um, the community colleges are absolutely essential part of our educational infrastructure in the country. And what's increasingly happening with some of these colleges that's very strategic, they're also working with the skilled labor unions. So they have <clears> partnerships <throat> now that are integrating that. But also, I think on the community college front, the Department of Labor, you know, this is an example of not having this overall system of coordination. They have, you know, millions of dollars that go into workforce development boards in each state and aligning those with the needs of business, the future jobs, <clears throat> how the unions participate, and how the community colleges have to do that additional advanced training is very, very significant. And the community colleges have an incredible track record of their graduates getting jobs right away. <clears throat> so they are essential. And we have in the council a, a group of university president leaders, and Jerry Moorhead, the president of the University of Georgia, said, we need to work at the college level more with the workforce in our regions. And I think that's another example of this recognition of how these, all things, these things all come together in a system. Can anybody else elaborate on getting this NSF money? into the community colleges as well, because like I said, Wake Tech has been very good at that, but we would love, love to have that spread around more. Yeah, in fact, it, your, your point is right, that a lot of two-year colleges don't really know much about working with NSF and so on, and this gets to a point that was made earlier about diversity. Um, we, we like to think about giving money out to all these different organizations, but a lot of times they don't have the fundamental capabilities to manage a grant award. Uh, and we sort of set them up for failure. If there's an audit risk and all of a sudden something goes south, they're caught in a really bad place. So one of the programs NSF has started recently is a program to basically create a community of research administrative um, personnel who can work across all kinds of different institutions to bring those 
to the table who aren't now currently participating. So if you're a two-year college, you don't have to develop all that stuff yourself. You can partner with somebody who can help you do that. That really empowers and resources you to do it without you having to make all kinds of investments that you really can't afford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. And on that, I would like to recognize a gentleman from California, Mr. Obernolte. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses. Uh, Mr. Kitchen, I'd like to start with you. Uh, I find your testimony on uh, Chinese intellectual property theft incredibly compelling. Um, you characterize as one of the largest thefts of wealth in human history, which is uh, a, a way that I hadn't put it, uh, I hadn't heard it put before. Uh, I, you also uh, mentioned the importance of confronting Chinese intellectual property theft. Uh, that's obviously more easily said than done. What exactly do you think we could do to confront that? And what specifically can Congress do in that mission? Thank you, sir. <clears throat> the uh, statistic about the, the largest uh, transfer of, of wealth in history is, is a quote from FBI Director Ray, And he's been uh, very forthcoming about his assessment of the situation. I would align myself with that assessment. Um, in terms of confronting uh, Chinese theft, uh, there's a host of things that we can do. Um, one, we can begin enforcing our intellectual property rights and laws internationally, using that as a, um, as a point of negotiation in international engagement with the Chinese government and in, in international uh, standard setting, uh, uh, standard setting settings uh, as well. But frankly, there's a lot lower hanging fruit that um, is, is, can be difficult domestically, and I, I, I briefly alluded to them. Um, and that is, we are being willingly robbed blind daily uh, by the presence of, um, of, of Chinese technology companies in the US marketplace. Um, and I want to be clear when I talk about this. <clears throat> I am not accusing every Chinese uh, origin technology company as being malevolent. They don't need to be malevolent. They simply need to be compliant with Chinese law, because Chinese law is explicit and very clear. Um, the Chinese government has been very kind in publishing their law, their national security law, their cybersecurity laws in English, because they expect US companies to comply with those laws. And those laws are very clear in the fact that they require that every bit and byte of data that is collected by, transferred, stored on, or any other way touches a Chinese network or the network of a company that is owned by a Chinese company to be made available to the Chinese Communist Party. That is not ambiguous. That is not unclear. That is a fundamental requirement of operating in, the Chinese, in China. And so we need to recognize that and confront it. Now, not all industries are the same, so I'm not arguing for a, a reckless decoupling. But to answer your question directly, sir, if we want to begin to protect not only our intellectual property uh, and our, um, our, our individual data, there's some pretty obvious doors that we need to close. And I'm happy to see that conversation advancing in the public sphere. OK. Uh, thank you. Your thinking aligns with mine in a number of different degrees. This is uh, an area that I also think needs a lot of attention. I've got a bill to enable extraterritorial prosecution of Chinese uh, companies and individuals that engage in theft of intellectual property from US companies. I'm also very concerned about Chinese components in the Internet of Things. Uh, I think that that's something that we haven't paid enough attention to, the, you know, the fact that we've got uh, doorbells and uh, refrigerators and toaster ovens and garage door openers all collecting information about us that could be shared with malign actors who uh, could put that data to, to malicious use. Do you share that concern? I absolutely do. In fact, um, there is a Chinese IoT platform as a service company called Tuya. Uh, which dominates globally and the United States approximately 70% of the marketplace. So what that means is, is that if you are a, you know, a, a, a light bulb company and you want to begin making smart light bulbs, but you don't know how to do that, you will approach Tuya and they say, we got it. We can turn your light bulb into a smart light bulb and give you a platform for managing that capability. Uh, the problem with that is that it, as a Chinese company, is needs to be responsive to the laws that I just previously outlined. So what that means is, is that this nation might have done a great work by removing Huawei, for example, from its 5G networks, only to then allow Chinese-owned IoT devices to continue collecting the same information we were trying to protect. Right. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Badil, uh, good to see you again. 
Uh, congratulations again on uh, your success at NIST. Uh, it's uh, an amazing uh, leap forward, and I think that, uh, you know, really uh, this is going to be, the, we're on the cusp of, you know, like an inflection point in, in uh, fusion research as a result of the work that you're doing. But uh, just briefly, I, I can see I'm almost out of time. Uh, you've highlighted the need to, uh, for continued investment to create, to increase the yields on the fusion ignitions that you're achieving at NIST uh, through the inertial confinement technology that, that you're working on. Um, commercialization, though, I think is going to center more around magnetic confinement than inertial confinement. Uh, so can you just take a minute and explain why continued investment in inertial confinement is, uh, is a good use of taxpayer dollars? Yes, thank you very much for the question. Um, it's early days for the inertial confinement fusion energy application, uh, mostly because we just achieved fusion ignition, which is the foundational building block for that technology. Um, I think you'll see a rapid growth in the IFE community, and there are several companies with significant, significant capacity that have already entered the marketplace on our technology. So we'll see how the next few years play out. Inertial fusion energy has a couple of advantages as an application. One is that the energy generating source is separate from the driver, so we can develop both of those in parallel. Um, but to your point, the magnetic fusion community has had a much more significant footprint in the private sector. Uh, and has some significant runway there. Um, I think the promise of inertial fusion energy is very significant. Uh, the facilities that we have are, are built for national security applications. So if we really want to understand what's possible in the next few years, it's very important that we, that we begin to invest in the energy applications and understand what the possibilities are there. Well, we look forward to your continued success. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Thank you. Now I'd like to recognize a gentleman from uh, New York, Mr. Bowman. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Boudel, thank you so much for being here, and thank you uh, for the briefing you provided to us uh, a few weeks ago. Um, fusion ignition, like, wow. Like, the first time in human history this has been done. Uh, like, can we all just take a moment and recognize this? Everyone's up here talking fast and trying to get through questions. I just want to acknowledge how extraordinary this is and just recognize you for your incredible leadership throughout your entire life focusing on this issue. Thank you so much. And when I read about this, I thought I was reading something from a science fiction novel or watching a Marvel movie or something. Can you talk about and summarize for us what this accomplishment could mean specifically for our clean energy future? Yes, thank you very much. And yes, it never gets tired, never gets old to hear people say ignition. Um, so basically what happened in the experiment that we did in December is we used two megajoules, two million joules of laser energy to create over three million joules of fusion energy out of the target. And that's the first time in history that more fusion energy has been produced than the energy required to drive the experiment uh, across any approach to fusion. So that's incredibly important. Uh, we built this facility and we have been on this research path for our national security applications. So that uh, process of developing an igniting target and increasing the yield is critically important to the stockpile stewardship program. In order to begin to think about energy applications, uh, we need to think about some additional challenges. The targets that we use to do these experiments are beautiful, exquisite works of art. Uh, in order for this to be viable as an energy uh, source, we need to be able to make these targets very robust, higher yield, and much simpler to manufacture and produce. We need to move from a system that produces one fusion ignition shot a week uh, to having the capacity to do that repeatedly, uh, ultimately 10 times a second. And we have many of the component technologies that would enable that. Um, but until we had this fundamental building block, we couldn't really begin to move on some of the key questions that stand between what we've done to date and a potential energy application. If we are successful, it is feasible to develop a fusion energy, plat fusion energy power plant based on the inertial fusion energy approach <clears throat> that could be commercially viable. Again, we're making extrapolations based on what we know today. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, and I will say it's not just engineering at this point. There is still physics to be explored and, and to learn from. But that includes you know, advanced laser technologies, uh, tritium management, 
and recycling, um, balance of plant issues, materials for radiation environments, et cetera. If we're successful, Fusion holds the promise of providing baseload scale energy, clean, without many of the long-term uh, waste concerns uh, that have been raised around fission technologies. So it has an abundant fuel source uh, and can work at scale independent of location. So most of the renewable energy is very regional in character. Uh, fusion really is a clean baseload source of energy. That's incredible. It feels like this is a moonshot moment for us. And we need a moonshot style national effort to make fusion energy a reality. Do you agree with that? Let's move heaven and earth, all a government approach, private sector, this is our moonshot moment. I agree with that. Um, we have spent 60 years creating this fundamental building block. We will continue to pursue this R&D for our important national security applications, but the prospects for energy are real, and they will require a whole of nation, private sector, public sector, uh, community-based approach to advancing the science and technology here. And we have demonstrated in the past with efforts like this what we're capable of as a nation when we bring together the best minds, the best technology, the best elements of the private sector and the public sector. Uh, and this is an uh, incredibly exciting challenge. So as I mentioned earlier, students are really energized about the prospects for fusion, maybe pun intended. Um, and so there's, there is a willing uh, body of intellectual capital that's ready to move on this problem if the resources are available to make it move forward. Dr. Drogmeyer, can you add anything to what was just stated? I'd just like to clap. Okay. <laughs> I just think this is... It, it's are we allowed to clap in the hearing room? <laughs> I think we should clap. Yeah, we could do that. <laughs> I, I, to underscore the point that, that she just made, those 60 years, that's taking the long haul view, right? That's being patient, investing, investing in something, and all of a sudden we have this extraordinary thing, not only for our national defense capabilities, but also for the future of our energy. Uh, and that's just, I think, a beautiful, beautiful thing. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much, and uh, absolutely, congratulations, Erin. And that, that information certainly needs to be protected as well as we go forward with that research. I'd like to recognize the uh, gentlewoman from uh, Oklahoma, Ms. Bice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank the witnesses for being here this afternoon, and a special shout out to uh, Dr. Drogmeyer, who is uh, my fellow Oklahoman. I want to um, direct this first question to Ms. Wint-Smith, and that is, in your opening statement, you talked a little bit about the Valley of Death. And I had a opportunity to sit at a round table yesterday uh, with Chairman Lucas, uh, with technology innovation uh, owners that are trying to really, you know, ensure that we have superior capabilities over our adversaries, including China. But that was also brought up. What do you think we as Congress can be doing to try to bridge that gap, um, whether it's existing programs that need to be modified or other ways that we can continue to um, promote that type of needed innovation. Thank you for that very important question. And I have to say, I've been working on this issue for most of my career, so I hope someday I'll never hear Valley of Death. Um, one of the is issues is that we do not have a financing system in the United States that moves beyond the initial kind of startup phase into manufacturing. And I'll just share an example. Back in the 90s and even earlier, this country invented every single flat panel display technology, the first being liquid crystals out of Kent State, plasma, field emitters, the list went on. And there was lots of venture capital coming into that. But then it was time to make the manufacturing plant and scale it up, not a penny. All of that went to Asia. We have the example of A123 battery. More, hundreds of millions went into that, including from the Department of Energy, the state of Michigan. Again, it was the manufacturing scale up that takes lots of money. So we have to figure out in our country a way to bridge that. It's not gonna be from traditional venture capital. Our banks are not engaged in this. There are no incentives for that. We have called at the council for many, many years for a national infrastructure bank Many countries have that, where they could make these large-scale investments 
on the manufacturing side, and this is very relevant to commercializing the fusion. It is an all-nation hand. We're not going to get to where we could if we don't have massive investment from the government and private sector. But on the valley of death, we really need to have some expanded programs, including SBIRs. There are uh, companies that just spend their time getting SBIR grants. It's kind of an industry. And I can tell you, when I was Assistant Secretary of Commerce, there were groups outside the United States who would look at those SBI awardees. They knew they couldn't go after stage B, and they'd come in and acquire them. And that's happening now in Silicon Valley and elsewhere. So having SBR stage C that takes it farther on is one mechanism, and the states could actually contribute that as well. It doesn't need to be just federal. So it really requires new models and, and really moving out of our traditional mode of thinking, oh, we have the great, we do have a great venture capital industry, but they don't invest in the kinds of things we're talking about here. Happy to open the question up for any of the other witnesses if you'd like to comment. If not, I'll follow up on another question. Okay. Um, the, the second question is that, you know, America's economic future is dependent on successfully driving innovation and productivity growth in all parts of the country. What role will regional innovation initiatives have in securing um, U.S. leadership in research and technology? And this is open to any of the panelists. I think regional innovation is key, and, and again, back to the diversity question, um, we need to bring the technological capabilities and development opportunities to those regions because we want to transform the regions. We don't want to take the people out of the regions. Maybe their families have been there for 50, 60 years. We want to, we want to lift those regions up, and so, so I think that the regional and, and sort of, uh, I think as we heard, the, the place-based innovation is really critical. Uh, NSF is doing this now with the EPSCoR program. I think a lot of you are familiar with this. Whereas before it was, hey, how can we help you know, increase the research competitiveness? Now the focus is on what they're calling jurisdictional transformation, getting the universities, getting the small business uh, community, getting the, the, uh, the federal, or getting the state governments rather, getting the chambers of commerce together and say, how can we transform our entire state using science and technology. Uh, Oklahoma is a very rural state. North Carolina is a rural state. There are a lot of great opportunities to, to do innovation, to get these folks involved, but we have to really think about, about how, you know, how, to, how to resource that and do that and build these partnerships at the state level in particular or in the regional level as well. And I think that's really a key to our future is not just doing it at the well-resourced places, but, but having every zip code of the country become involved. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Now I'd like to recognize uh, uh, Ms. Linus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the panel. Um, climate change is a uniquely unifying threat across scientific disciplines and across nations, and I'm proud to represent the Oregon 6th Congressional District, a state that has long taken climate concerns seriously. And while each state and nation is dealing with its own climate consequences based on its infrastructure, geography, and economy, it's not really a problem that can be addressed in, addressed in um, jurisdictional isolation. And so when it comes to climate, remaining competitive on the global stage necessarily involves fostering international collaboration with disadvantaged nations on the front lines of sea levels rising, as well as with scientifically sophisticated competitors who may have a more mature climate strategy. And so my questions for the panel, first, when it comes to competing with China and the need to address climate change, what does that global leadership in science and technology development look like? And then um, I'll give you my second question. And then how can the U.S. best build upon the progress of other nations, including competitor nations? And it's generally to the panel, so whoever would like to answer. I guess I'm the climate guy. Um, so. With regard to science technology development, I think it's, there's no question, and we haven't really talked about this yet, but in terms of the, the research in our nation, I think the importance of, of Chinese nationals coming to study here is very, very important uh, to our future. Um, again, an opportunity to lead with our values, to be constructively vigilant, to, to model for these folks you know, what, what playing by the rules actually looks like. Um, and why is it OSDP? I asked the question, suppose we just shut off all the immigration instantaneously, how long would it take us to get to where we would be otherwise? And we're talking generations. So we, we really have to, have to collaborate. The climate, the climate challenge is a very important one for which I think they're, they're certainly, as you say, it's an international problem. Part of the problem, though, is that, that China is 
a huge global emitter, and it's building coal-fired power plants in other countries for reasons we heard about previously, but that does not get counted against China's, China's uh, contributions to, to a greenhouse gas emissions. So I think we need to, again, have China be honest about what it's doing and say, okay, if we're going to really solve this challenge, technology and research are part of it, but also mitigation is another very important part of it, and getting China to own up to the fact that, yes, it might be emitting you know, twice as much as us with regard to CO2 or whatever, they're actually emitting a whole lot more than that because they're putting these plants in other countries and getting a foothold there in their energy systems and also their data systems. So it's a very kind of nefarious thing. So I don't know if that answers your question, but, but as an S&T enterprise, we really do need, uh, we need a global approach here and we need researchers from China working with us on the climate challenge. So I'd like to add, uh, we have really formidable capacity in the U.S. to understand how the climate is evolving and what the impacts will be to nations in the developing world in particular. And we have an opportunity to build partnerships, science and technology cooperation partnerships um, with many of those nations to help them understand what the impacts are that are coming, what the technology solutions are that are available today that could be deployed, and there are many, uh, and to help them identify strategies to sustainably transition their energy supply. I think this idea of thinking about S&T as a bridge builder you know, that's S&T cooperation with allies and partners at scale. That's with the developing world, Europe, our traditional partners in the UK, in Asia, in Japan, in Korea, in Australia, in India. Uh, but also working with these smaller nations uh, to help them build capacity and to really use um, the fruits of our research enterprise to help them develop uh, more sustainable paths forward and to use that as a way to, to increase U.S. influence in how these countries think about their future. Um, in climate modeling, we have the capacity today to really understand at a very local level what the impacts are likely to be over time. And so I, I think this is a, an underappreciated form of international uh, diplomacy and U.S. leadership that we should be exercising. I would just add, and it's a wonderful opportunity for our Agency for International Development and sister agencies around the world to collaborate on this and to leverage what they're doing in different parts, particularly of the developing world, as opposed to a lot of those programs kind of operating in silos. If, if I can just add quickly, um, the, the Weather Act that this committee will reauthorize, I believe, uh, has a lot of provision in there for work at the weather climate interface. So we're talking about these developing nations, these other nations, their economies may be very agrarian. The very local effects are what are important. So it, it sort of is not just the two-week weather timeline, but the timeline out to several months and you know, a couple of planning seasons is very, very important. So this kind of research is, is really the key point. And if you think about reauthorizing the Weather Act, you might want to think about really highlighting that point. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as a freshman, newly elected, been here about two months, and spent 30 years in uh, private business as a small business person. Um, Ms. Wynn Smith, I, I heard when you were speaking earlier, you talked about a unified vision and economic issues and public liability and regulations and antitrust and and I look at it as a point of if we can compete with anybody in the world in small business and and I took that personally as is the same things that I saw in small business as a overreach from our federal government uh, regulations and bureaucracies out there that really regulate most businesses to the point where they can't compete or they have to look for outside sources and um, I guess my question in, is a nuts, in a nutshell is, do you think that, uh, that the government overreach and excess regulations uh, are hindering our ability to compete with China? Thank you for that very important question. And, you know, regulation is always a, a balance issue. It's sort of like the golden mean. We do need regulation, but we don't need too much regulation. And so how we get to the right point is the challenge. And Certainly, we in the United States have over-regulated in many, many areas vis-a-vis -vis our competitors. Certainly, China. I mean, they're on the side where they don't regulate. I've been told if you go to a facility where they're actually processing rare earth materials, you think you're in a different age and different place. I mean, there's absolutely no regulation whatsoever on safety, health, environmental. So it is a balance issue. 
But I think on some of the regulation in the United States, we are, it's almost like we're Gulliver and the Lilliputians are tying our hands because product liability reform um, has, has gone to the point, and we've, we've tried over the years to reform this as a bipartisan issue, but if you produce a chemical as a small business and one of your customer buys it and something happens through what they did with it, the liability goes all the way back to you. So we know that many, many corporations in the United States actually stopped production and moved overseas because of the punitive nature of our product liability. And again, it's a balance issue. So I do think that this is a matter that we can have, you know, the best science and technology, we can have lots of startups, but it takes regulation, it takes capital, it takes trade to get these into the marketplace. And these are issues that we need to work on. And in many, many ways, we have over-regulated. We need to bring that back, but still protect safety, environmental health, and the transparency of a business for its consumers. All right, hold, hold that thought. I want to, Mr. Kitchen, did you want to, could you add to some of that? I knew you gave several examples like the doorbells and stuff. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> I think the thing that most concerns, so I would align myself with everything that was just previously said. I think uh, obviously uh, some type of regulatory regime is essential. It's, it's what sets us apart so that, you know, our airplanes typically don't crash, right? And that's in large part because of the regulatory structures that we have. Uh, at the same time, we are playing a balancing game as we try to allow our innovation industry to run free and to be aggressive and agile. That's a, a critical capability. So these are the balancing acts. I think when it comes to regulation, one of my most fundamental concerns, as I mentioned in my testimony, is where uh, many of our allies and partners are going. Um, to be frank, many of these uh, allies and partners seem to think that the goal is to produce as robust and aggressive a regulatory uh, scheme as possible. Instead, I would argue that the goal should be to produce as robust and as aggressive innovation capability as possible. And so when our friends in the European Union and even to our north in Canada are considering uh, explicit policies that deliberately seek to decouple US technology companies and that will have the net benefit of preferencing Chinese alternatives, all under the guise of digital sovereignty. I want to express a type of empathy with their underlying motivations, but warn them as a friend, you're doing it all wrong. And that if that's not uh, arrested and, and, and brought into a, a better sense of things, it will result not only in hurting the United States, which is bad enough, but it will preference and allow China to move in and assume a position uh, that it will almost assuredly abuse. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Wentz-Smith, one quick question. 90% of the graphite is found in China, produced in China, or just refined in China? It's coming out of China, both refined. I don't know if it's all produced. But I just heard this from a very exciting startup um, battery company. and So they don't have 90% of the graphite? Not in the world, no. But it's coming from them. They have the and processing I would say that's probably due to permitting regulations and mining big, restrictions big part of it. right here. Thank you. you back. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, recognize the uh, gentleman from Florida, Mr. Frost. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for convening this important hearing, and thank you to our witnesses. Uh, look, I, I believe that the greatest challenge facing our country and the world is the climate crisis. Um, my generation fears that we will lose drinkable water, breathe, breathable air in our lifetimes, and worry that our childhood homes will be flooded out by the sea level rise and food will become scarce. And this is especially important in my state of Florida, we're a frontline community. As you know, um, last year we had two storms that completely decimated and wiped out uh, many of our coastline cities. It was a great issue in my district. One thing that the United States can do right now is lead the world in science and technology advancements to help prevent the climate collapse. And I believe we have to enact near-term solutions and develop long-term strategy to make sure that the U.S. science and tech fields can meet this challenge. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr uh, Drogemeyer, I wanted to ask, how could this uh, national science and technology strategy address near-term resilience goals and also long-term prevention goals to address the climate crisis? Oh, it's an excellent question, and I think that's exactly the purpose of the strategy. And frankly, that's why I think the four-year timeline is, is great, because it's kind of the same as the National Climate Assessment, but also putting in the context of a 25-year horizon where it goes beyond elections and beyond 
you know, beyond the normal thing. And, and people say, well, we've never done that before. That's the whole point, you know. A meteorologist telling you to do a 25-year forecast, that's not what I'm saying. I'm basically saying, let's think long-term about the overarching broad S&T issues and, and the kinds of things that we want to do as a nation, not the specifics, you know. So um, with regard to the, uh, to the S&T, uh, you know, very simple climate models tell us that you increase uh, greenhouse gases, the planet will warm. We don't need all the sophistication. We do need the sophistication, though, to know what the localized impacts are. We don't do a great job with that, to be honest. Uh, the, the error bars on the, on the, the, the actual uh, projections are pretty large, but we are doing a lot of work, I think, to improve those. So the models are basically all that we have, and the thoughtful approaches as to how the population will grow, what the technology mix will be, and things like that, all these different scenarios that are played out. So I think from the, the short term, we need to think about uh, you know, measures that are mitigation adaptive. You look at a lot of the um, a lot of the commercials on TV now. Everybody's doing EVs, right? Because we're starting to have infrastructure that will allow that to happen with our with our power grid. The longer term things, if you look at the models, the greatest uncertainty in the short term is the actual atmospheric uncertainty in, in the model itself, the actual natural variability. You get beyond 20 years or so, the great uncertainty is in the energy mix and the population, all that sort of thing. So I think we need to continue to, to study those things, take even more thoughtful approaches, and look at improving the physics of the models, building, you know, I would love to see us in this country build a, what the Jap Japanese did 20 years ago, an earth simulator, a computer designed specifically. Yeah. Livermore could be the perfect place to house this. Yeah. Really, you know, we, we write our codes in a way that has to adapt to transaction processing computers just because that's what is out there. You know, Suppose we as a nation said we're going to put $2 billion into building a computer designed just to simulate the Earth system and do what no other nation can do in terms of climate projection. That would be an enormously valuable investment because we have the capability, but we don't have the computational capability to run these models that the, that the resolutions needed to capture clouds and hurricanes and things like that. We're just waiting for computing to get there. Yeah. Let's fast forward computing technology and build something as a nation that would get us there. Thank you. No, I really, and that, that leads to my next question, you know, the other benefits of this work. Um, Dr. Budell, uh, I wanted to ask, so Orlando, where, where I'm from, we're quickly becoming the simulation hub of the country, which is really exciting. We actually, was just at the Orlando Economic Partnership, which is an organization, and we have the first uh, city digital twin, a complete digital twin of Orlando, which is going to be great. Um, I wanted to ask, what, uh, what do you believe advancements in computer, uh, in computer simulation technology to model the impact of climate change could give us a competitive edge? Um, yes, thank you for the questions. Excellent line of questioning, and I agree completely, and I agree with my colleagues' comments entirely. Uh, the Department of Energy has been on the front line of uh, advancing the state of the art in climate mod modeling for some time and is currently developing the ESM3 code, which is the Earth System Simulation Model uh, uh, next generation that's anticipated to run on our new largest computers. So. Oak Ridge has just cited uh, Frontier, which is a large exascale computer. Livermore will be home to the first um, exascale computer slated for national security applications. It will also do open science applications like climate, and it'll produce at over two exaflops. Mm -hmm. So we're beginning to have the computing capacity and the modeling and simulation tools to do this work. It's going to be incredibly enabling. And with the introduction of tools like artificial intelligence and machine learning, we're able to advance the capabilities of our models very quickly relative to what we were able to do in the past. By taking on board large amounts of data, we're getting much more data at higher fidelity about different aspects of the climate system. Uh, using those tools to really smartly advance the state of the art, I think will help with the error bar problem, which is a significant challenge going forward. But we should be able to give communities uh, a real edge in understanding what's likely to be visiting them, not just today, but yeah. uh, several years down the road. Thank you so much. I have more questions, but I've, I've run out of time, but really appreciate uh, your time today and excited to work with this committee on advancing our um, economy and national security by investing in the green energy economy. Really appreciate it. I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say thank you to Chairman Lucas and Ranking Member Lofgren for holding this important hearing. And thank you to our witnesses for your insight today. I don't think there's more of an appropriate topic for this committee to address through its first hearing of Congress. The Chinese Communist Party is the United States' greatest threat on the world stage. It is critical that we remain a global leader in cutting edge science and advanced technologies to address this threat and to ensure our economic and national security for generations to come. 
One issue I'd like to focus on today is the need for a skilled workforce as a key component of our strategic competition with China. Roughly 36 million jobs in the United States today are part of the STEM workforce. That is nearly one quarter of all jobs nationally. And these 36 million jobs, 17 million of them are filled by skilled technical workers who have a wealth of science, engineering, and technical knowledge, but do not hold four-year degrees. Clearly, there is a need for a career in technical education programs that equip workers with much needed skills without saddling them with unmanageable debt. A more robust approach to career and technical education will ensure that we are able to train workers properly and remain competitive with China, which has made efforts to recruit top foreign talent, including from American universities, industry, and government. Dr. Drogemeyer, you put it simply in your testimony, it boils down to people. As part of this, you propose an initiative similar to the GI Bill to coordinate workforce development on a national scale with broad national goals that involve all sectors of the science and technology enterprise. Can you elaborate on the need for federal involvement in a coordinated approach to STEM workforce development programs that we have here? Congressman, thank you so much. Uh, I loved your, um, your, your, your comments there and your, your spot on. Uh, we have a lot of great programs that are going on. I think at last count there were well over 150 STEM education programs, some large, some small. There are a lot of nonprofits doing great things. And like I said earlier, there's like a thousand flowers blooming, but where are the big gardens? Um, if you look at the GI Bill, it, it really had two pieces to it. One was to thank the servicemen and women who were responsible for the Allied victory in World War II, coming back from World War II. And the other thing was they're an important part of our future, so let's make sure we invest in them. So my thought about something, a GI Bill type activity here would be to say, we need to coordinate much more effectively vis-a-vis -vis the national S&T strategy, which gives us the chance to do something we've never done before, really, I think, to look at this from a holistic national point of view, to create really what I would call not a, a U.S. talent program, but a U.S. sort of a capabilities investment program, to bring people to the fore, whether they're, they're in looking at a skilled technical workforce or whatever, um, to, to create a framework that has basically a, a system that has them you know, being educated and trained, but then also giving service back to our nation, which is in fact the GI Bill, the service came on the front end, this would come on the back end actually. I don't think it ought to be a handout, it ought to be, not be a freebie, but it ought to be structured like the GI Bill to where part of that was, was loans to start companies, part of it was tuition and so on. I think getting folks into the game from all over America is so critically important. And as, as I think Deborah said, you know, we're fielding a baseball team with one player. This gets a chance for all these folks who have, I've seen capabilities all over this country in the places you would least expect to find them. We need to get those missing millions. We need to go find them. We need to bring them in. And we need to incentivize and provide them resources to be successful, but then say, you know what? You owe a debt of gratitude to our nation. Here's the service component of that. And we build on American exceptionalism, I think, in doing so. Yeah, I, I could not agree more with your assessment. Uh, Ms. Wood smith you also raised the issue of regional diversity within the innovation economy as part of the National Science and Technology Strategy. In your testimony, you highlighted the fact that the innovation workforce is concentrated largely in metropolitan areas such as Boston, San Francisco, San Jose, Seattle, and San Diego. You also wrote one-size-fits-all approaches to supporting regional innovation, ignore these crucial geographic distinctions, and fail to capitalize on different regions' core competencies and advantages. As someone who represents a middle America district in Northeast Ohio, I sympathize with this view. I want to see jobs pop up in Cleveland, Parma, Medina, Worcester, Strongsville, and other communities in our area, not just in big coastal cities. So do you think that regional centers dedicated to completing excuse me, complementing the existing capabilities and resources of a specific area would result in an organic pipeline for workforce development. Thank you for that wonderful question. And you, I have to say, I'm from Akron. Oh, nice. So I, I know the region right very well. And I know, of course, that Toledo was, the, as I said, <clears throat> the inventor of one of the flat panel displays and, you know, first solar, et cetera. Um, I think that this is really a regional leadership issue. I think that what happens often in states and regions that all these dots are not connected. The workforce development boards do not collaborate with the economic development boards. You have to bring in sort of the leaders of the community and you can see the power of a leader in a community. I'll, I'll just cite San Diego. You know, San Diego still is a great center of our U.S. Navy, but it's become a leader in wireless communications and biotech. 
because of how they brought all that together and one startup, Linkabet, that became Qualcomm. So leadership is very, very critical for this. Um, and also the educational establishment from K through 12 all the way up, including you know, leaders who are doing our sports activity. We put so much time and effort in developing talent for people going into sports, but we don't do the same for them going into STEM. I mean, it would be great to have a cybersecurity core, but on, but on the regional economic development, I'm seeing across the country, and the US Council on Competitiveness is so focused on this, just tremendous capability that's not even known. And so the National Science Foundation, you know, the other departments are really making an effort to go out and identify through these hubs and investments how they can create an anchor and then build for this. And then, of course, the issue is on capital. Venture capital, you know, for certain types of things is great, but it's concentrated. But still, in all these regions, there are some high net worth individuals who are doing things. Nebraska's a fabulous example of that. So we have all the ingredients. Would the gentle lady wrap up, please? We have all the ingredients. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You'll back my time. Thank you. Even though you're from Accra and I'm from Cleveland, the gentleman's from <laughs> Cleveland, we're, we have to call it quits on that. We now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Mullen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you to our witnesses for your testimony. Uh, I come from San Mateo County in the San Francisco Bay Area, home to uh, some innovative partnerships. I really appreciate the community college references as well, uh, retraining. Uh, with community colleges and our local uh, workforce development boards and our life sciences sector, which is, which is a very robust one. Uh, so my question is, is a bit of a follow-up, Dr. Uh, Drugmeyer. Uh, you were talking about the national STEM strategy and uh, GI Bill approach, uh, but you did reference supplanting uh, some existing programs, and I just want to get a sort of sense um, you know, the existing workforce uh, investment act funding streams, and uh, there's money in chips now, uh, investments in, in IRA on, on clean energy. How do you pull all of these things together into a, a coordinated uh, funding approach where there's some coherence, but you're also integrating? I say this as a uh, former local workforce investment board member uh, who always appreciated uh, dealing with some of those federal funding streams coming down to the local level, how we integrate all of that in a coordinated way. You, you said it so beautifully, and it's, it's that whole of nation approach, I think, that those local boards play an extremely important role and their voice needs to be at the table. So I think it's a question of scaling up, and in no way do I suggest that, that a lot of these programs aren't doing good things or whatever, but I think the, the, what you created with the national S&T strategy is an opportunity to step way back from all the wonderful individual things and say, what do we do as a nation and how do we coordinate it? How do we not, not it's not about control, but it's about coordination and scaling and having a, a symbiosis among all of these different programs to where we're, we're looking to achieve national goals, not, hey, my little program is doing this and it's doing great things, but how is it feeding the national goal of workforce development, of economic development, of, of diversity enhancement? That's the thing that I think you have wonderfully handed to OSTP in the community and said, you guys go figure this out. And that's what I am looking forward to doing. And I really appreciate you doing that because that's never really happened before. Thank you for that. Just a, a quick follow-up on scale. Um, well aware of large companies being able to um, um, operate at scale and, and innovate and, and develop STEM partnerships, but a lot of the uh, innovation is happening in smaller companies. You know, we're talking you know, five uh, people in the R&D uh, space doing uh, incredible work. How do we, as we think uh, uh, going forward, how do we develop an S&T strategy that really integrates some of those smaller companies. Just any thoughts in that regard, I'd welcome. So I'll chime in since I brought this up earlier. I think this is an excellent question. Um, I think part of it is creating mechanisms uh, to give people access to the tools and capabilities they need to continue their progress. So for example, if you're a small company developing hard technology, the barriers to entry in the market are enormous. Just the cost of building capacity to do the R&D you need to advance your technology. And this national look can say, okay, what could a regional center do to develop central capabilities that many companies could have access to for advanced machining capabilities or different types of laboratory facilities or ex access to high performance computing, and then using existing institutions, academic institutions or national laboratories or others to help bring expertise 
uh, to these companies to help them advance their capabilities quickly. I think it's really a new kind of partnership ecosystem where we really try to think about all the national assets and how we can bring them together in new ways. Could I just follow up on that last point? Um, a lot of uh, small businesses, as you say, can't afford wet labs, clean rooms, things like that. But universities have these things, and believe me, they're not busy all the time. And so now you can, uh, private companies can go in and legally use these facilities by paying for them. The universities are not competing unfairly with the private sector by undercutting them because they're nonprofits. These partnerships are so important. And this is where you can also build wonderful linkages for R&D with the universities. But it might just start with sharing a facility that you need to have to fabricate a device or something as a small startup, which are, they're incredibly agile and they're wonderful and they're the bedrock of our economy. Economy. Thank you for that. I yield back. Thank the gentleman, and I'll yield myself uh, for a round of questioning. Uh, oh, one of the nice things about going last is that everyone else has asked questions, probably asked every question. They just haven't been asked by me. So uh, I'm going to stick to pretty much two questions. One is a recap. Uh, uh, Ms. Smith and others can weigh in on this, but you know, when talking about the centers of excellence and talking about trying to reach out all over the country, uh, and by the way, as a Clevelander, I'm very proud of Case Western uh, as a, a university of excellence, but I'm a San Diegan, so I'm even more proud of the University of California, San Diego, and very aware of what Stanford represented to the building of Silicon Valley. At the end of the day, Aren't our universities in many, many cases the reason, not the size of a city, because San Jose was a pretty hick town when they got going, but aren't, isn't it not about the size, but in fact the excellence of the universities, and that those are naturally places that within the technology, UC Davis uh, for agriculture and, and a lot of their areas of expertise, isn't that what we need to look for and recognize you you can't make every university a uh, center of e excellence, but every great university eventually creates a, f a field of interest and excellence. Thank, thank you, Congressman. That, you, you said it very, very well. The universities and our whole network across the country are crown jewel. No country in the world has the scale of universities, the, the, from community colleges all the way up to the most advanced research institutes in the world. And if you look throughout the country, yes, universities are anchoring, and they have the great potential to do more. So as we, uh, as a committee, uh, and we don't, we're not the committee that funds every university, but as we look at plans and we look at supporting a national plan, I, I was in Bozeman, Montana, for example, now, they know more about wheat and barley and, uh, and by the way, the beer it makes. Um, and, and they have just an amazing amount of technology there that I wouldn't have known if I hadn't uh, gone there on a, rich, uh, a congressional trip. But shouldn't we, as a Congress, look to the administration to have a plan that maps the world mostly as it is from a standpoint of university expertise, not grant writing as we would hope it would become, uh, which often works to the detriment of, do you really go to Bozeman, Montana to do nuclear fusion? Uh, any, is that consistent with all of your thoughts? I think we need to do both. And I think we have the capacity to do both. We want to continue. We're out of money, ma'am. So in yeah. fairness, let's be a little careful about that. We have massive debts. We're in a deficit that's unbelievable. So the idea that there's enough money to do everything we want to do versus using our money wisely is going to be an area that I know the chairman is very concerned about is how to get the best return for the taxpayer on those dollars that are already being spent because it's unlikely that we're going to dramatically increase dollars spent in this environment. And, and that wasn't what I was suggesting. What I was suggesting is whatever the area we want to work in, let's link together these universities with partnerships because there are other places in the country doing the advanced work in agriculture and just because they don't happen to be in Montana, they should be working together. So knitting these things together is absolutely the key to building up this infrastructure for the country in the future. Excellent, I agree. Um, last one is, uh, is one that's near and dear to my heart, even though I'm a native Clevelander and a Californian now. Uh, 
China does not respect intellectual property, and yet China is one of the greatest recipients of, of patents, both directly and indirectly, uh, directly in the sense that they have tremendous amount of applications that basically go back to the CCP, uh, indirectly because they are making acquisitions and inquiries and they have investment funds that essentially rake intellectual property out of the United States and take it back to China. Well, in fact, as a recipient of a Chinese patent, uh, I know it's as worthless as the paper it was printed on. Uh, should this committee look to the question, and other committees, including judiciary, look to the question of reciprocal activity, meaning should we continue to have China dealt with like a trusted partner? Should universities be free to share with mainland China as they do massive amounts of, uh, of the uh, work that the taxpayer pays for? Or should we have a plan to recognize that they are not an even-handed competitor? Your comments. Well, I'll just jump in on that. I do think we need reciprocity, and I think we need new models and mechanisms. For instance, one of the things we could do is that we identify stolen intellectual property that comes into any product that's entered into this country, we refuse its entry. We do this, we have a wonderful system for protecting the integrity of our food supply and agricultural products coming in, but we don't on intellectual property. And you know, I serve on the Commission for the Theft of American Intellectual Property, and they have some fabulous recommendations, but by the time we get through the process of identifying the impact of what's been stolen, often the company's out of business. So it is an absolutely critical crisis for the country. And just one metric, back in 2012, there was the data, if China implemented their existing intellectual property laws, however weak they are, we would have had $1.2 trillion more in GDP. And that was in the first report of the Commission on the Theft of Intellectual Property. Thank you. My time has expired. The uh, gentleman from, uh, gentlewoman from uh, Michigan, Michigan uh, Ms. Stevens. Thank you. Um, it, it's quite interesting thinking about com competition from the standpoint of, of American debt. I, I, I just can't imagine that the CCP is doing that. And well, some are debating uh, the integrity, the fiscal integrity of this nation by threatening to default America on its debt. I can't imagine a bigger vote in this chamber being won for our competitor countries than, than our own country. Um, but, but with that, um, look, we were very pleased in, in a bipartisan way to pass the Chips and Science Act. Much legislation that came through this committee, legislation I was, I was happy to author, and, and, and certainly recognizing that some of our colleagues who were more reticent to join onto legislation bolstering and investing in scientific research for the first time ever because they woke up to the, the threat in the competition uh, with the CCP. And so as we think about the Chips and Science Act and, and some of our great catching up that we have been doing uh, with that legislation, the first federal funding opportunity coming out just yesterday, uh, I'm interested in honing in on other technologies or R&D areas that we need to be investing in that we might not be thinking of. Dr. Budal, you had talked about supercomputing, we remember that race. Ms. Wynne Smith, we, we certainly have been collaborating for years on supercomputer technology and its benefits, but what other research applications should we be, be looking at? So I can begin, that's an excellent question. Um, I think the whole computing ecosystem is incredibly important. Uh, it's another great area where public-private partnerships have really spurred the development of high-performance computing at scale, which has enabled new kinds of science we didn't envision when we started down that path. So again, ensuring that we stay closely coupled to industry trends. Industry isn't going to build computers just for science because that's a very small market relative to what they uh, typically um, are focused on. So ensuring that the scientific community and the uh, industry that builds the machines are very closely coupled together and can advance and can take advantage of the new tools that are coming along in AI and machine learning and then looking at advanced technologies like quantum, neuromorphic computing and other uh, approaches that will really change the game for how we think about R&D. Uh, another area that's uh, critically important 
is that we've talked about a great deal here today is energy technologies. That includes uh, new technologies, for example, for long-term storage or batteries, other clean energy technologies in the future could be fusion energy technology. Uh, but taking U.S. leadership in some of these areas and really capitalizing on it. Um, I think advanced materials and manufacturing is another area where investment's really critical. That industry is changing very, very fast, and the nexus of high performance computing and manufacturing capabilities is going to change the game again. So in the next 10 years, you'll see something very different. And then the final one is biotechnology uh, and biosciences. Uh, barriers to entry in these fields are very low. They're moving very fast. And we have an opportunity with our capabilities, experimental and computational, uh, to really foundationally change uh, the speed and capacity of how we think about development of drugs and therapeutics, uh, how we think about disease, uh, and how we think about the technologies that will enable, enable us to better understand biological systems. Ms. Winston-Smith, did you want to chime in? Are, are policymakers listening and acting accordingly? It, it's hard to add to what Dr. Budell has said, but I would just mention um, biofabrication also is part of the biotechnology revolution. And, and, and certainly to the point about how we effectively utilize the taxpayer dollar for outcomes, for proven outcomes. Public-private partnerships, which you've mentioned several times in this hearing, tend to work. Are there any specific examples you'd like to, to point to that have been successful that we could build off of as a nation? I'll point to my favorite recent example. Uh, there was a partnership formed called ADAM, Accelerating Therapeutic Opportunities in Medicine. It was a partnership that started between a discussion between the National Cancer Institute and the Department of Energy. It included GlaxoSmithKline, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and University of California, San Francisco. So a very unique public-private partnership bringing together biosciences, clinical research, big pharma, uh, and the federal stakeholders that were key there. And the goal was to develop tools to uh, use com computational methods to very rapidly screen molecules for drug applications. So if you could take the drug development timeline from 10 years down to less than one year, it would make it much more economically feasible for companies to develop new molecules. For GSK, it wasn't about what, what can I do, it was about can I create a toolkit that allows my whole industry to move ahead. So from that perspective, they wanted to bring other companies into that partnership. I think that sort of pre-competitive landscape is a really novel feature and was uniquely enabling of what we were able to do there. Thank you, with that I'm out of town. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. McCormick. Good morning. Um, money is power, especially when it comes to technology. Developing technology is one of the most expensive things we do in the world. Uh, in 2019, I believe we had about $2.4 trillion of investment in R&D and, and technologies. Uh, the United States roughly had about $722 billion of that. Uh, but over the course of time, from the 60s up to 2020, we've gone from about 69% of the research done in the world to about 31%, so less than half uh, of what we used to do percentage-wise. Uh, this goes back to monetary policy. I'm concerned when it comes to technological advances between us and China in a nation that has anywhere from uh, roughly $20 trillion more debt than we do and a smaller GDP that they're basically held unaccountable while they buy our uh, debt, and they don't have the same central banking system accountability, uh, I'm concerned that we're being outpaced. We have no way to keep up in a fair, fair market. Nobody's holding them accountable. Uh, meanwhile, you, you discussed how important it is to have people in, in uh, foreign status come to our schools and work in our universities. I worked at, I taught at Georgia Tech and Morehouse for about four years. Georgia Tech is a leading uh, school in the nation in technologies, and yet we can have a Chinese student come over here and actually take their technology back there while they're spending trillions of dollars more on, on research and development. I just don't see how we win that battle because it's not a fair fight. How do we combat that? Well, it's, it's, it's the key question, I think, ultimately here in terms of one extreme is you lock everything down and you protect everything. That's not the answer. The other thing is you let it all be open. That's not the answer either. When you're looking at fundamental research, curiosity-driven research, a lot of people say, well, it gets published anyway, so what does it matter? Well, it matters because the pathway of doing that work and getting to the publication involves a lot of creativity, a lot of know-how that is very valuable, and it doesn't make its way into the publication. Publication is just the end result. So what we're trying to protect is the capability, the know-how, the um, 
sort of secret sauce that we have in our research laboratories like at Georgia Tech that results in the publications. I think, again, it's, it's really a question of, of educating people, having policies in place at, at universities in particular, uh, having resources that universities can turn to to understand and vet individuals. I'm going to interrupt you real quick because we're almost at two and a half yeah, minutes. Yeah, yeah, sure. Specifically, what I'm worried about yeah. is give me a specific example of those controls. I know we have to have policy involved, but I don't know of them. And, I, and I'll tell you, when I was at Georgia Tech, we had people go to jail mm -hmm. because of espionage, because of Chinese foreigners coming and stealing our secrets. And we spend about half of the R&D budget that goes to universities comes from our government, which in 2019 was about $40 billion of, of investment, and then everybody else invested in another $50 billion. So my question is, what are we specifically doing to safeguard those technologies? Well, again, I, I think we're, we're, we're educating people to look for certain behaviors, right? We're asking people to disclose relationships, which is a self-disclosure. And then, but here's the key, we can use open source analytics to determine if they're being honest. Because it's, it's all just based on, okay, if they say what they're, they're telling us who they really work with or who they're affiliated with, great. If they don't, well, we have no way of knowing. Okay, so if they're coming here from China, they're affiliated with China. They're getting educated and going back to China with what their education they're getting here that we put trillions of dollars into. Right. But they're also benefiting our universities. We're learning from it. And 90% of those people are staying here. They're not going back. And so they're yearning for freedom. They don't have the freedom to discover and create in China. The talent programs in China, frankly, are not working. They're failing because all this repatriation of talent, they're not getting the, the folks coming back. We're, we still lead in that area, but it's a precarious lead. Mm. So I'd you're right. make the point, too, that uh, of the 90% of the people who stay here in the United States, we should probably be keeping a pretty close eye on them because there's significant links back to the uh, the place where they come from, including the family that remains in place. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of pressure is put on them by the Chinese government to report behaviors, to report people who are their colleagues, students. Are you saying bad things about China? Are you supporting Taiwan? And things? There are considerable pressures being brought to bear on those individuals. So in some sense, we want to, we want to help them deal with that. But ultimately, it's the Chinese Communist Party that is the, the villain here, not the federal government trying to protect our capabilities, as you say, to make sure that we become and remain a global leader. Right. And, and with that, I, I have about 24 seconds. I'm supposing that nobody has the monetary uh, policy acumen to answer what we're doing to address the inconsistencies of the Chinese uh, central banking system and its advantages over us. I'll just add another topic for a future time is how they're doing debt financing of infrastructure all over the world and what that means. Exactly too. related. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Sorensen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eric Sorensen. I was born and raised in Rockford, Illinois, and attended Northern Illinois University, uh, where I studied communications and meteorology. Um, I served uh, my communities as a meteorologist from 1999 to 2021. My job was to help my community uh, by sharing the best information about upcoming severe weather and our changing climate. When people have access to accurate weather forecasts and climate data, uh, we know that they make good decisions about their personal safety and about their own future. So I want to extend a special welcome uh, to my fellow meteorologist on the panel, uh, Dr. Drogmeyer, uh, for being here. And uh, uh, I do want to very quickly uh, thank my uh, colleagues uh, in Oklahoma uh, for safely keeping people ahead of the storms in the past 24 to 36 hours. Uh, they saved lives, and that's the power of, uh, of meteorology. Um, I'm thrilled to join not only this committee, uh, but become the first meteorologist in Congress in nearly half a century. Today, I would like to focus on the structure of the U.S. approach to science and technology um, how our approach really differs from that of other countries, including China, and how we can use these differences to our advantage. So I'll start with uh, our meteorologist, esteemed uh, Dr. Drogemeyer. Uh, research institutions at our nation's universities, like in my district, Monmouth College and Augustana College, um, provide critical S&T uh, research, much does OU. Um, this type of research is often built upon the private industry uh, developing these new advanced technologies and investments. Uh, the private industries building on the advanced technology often develop in geographical proximity to the university that developed the basic technology. 
Um, this relationship benefits the community and the economy around the university. So my question, how do we ensure that private companies that utilize the freeform nature of S&T, R&D, uh, locate around the producing university, thus giving back to the community that produced the technology? Well, thank you so much for your, your good question and for your kind remarks there. Um, we, we do a lot of this at OU. In fact, we have companies locating on our campus. And how do you incentivize them to, to stay there? And a lot of times they'll develop it. I started a private company and it got, uh, got purchased, but it's still you know, in, in Norman. I think the key thing is to make sure you lower the barrier to entry to interact with the university in terms of uh, if they're on the campus, you provide space uh, for them at, at rates that do not undercut what they could get in the community, but in fact are, are commensurate. But the, the value of being there is perhaps sort of co-marketing, of being able to go to seminars, getting access to students, having students work in your company, and so on. As you're developing the technology, the university kind of becomes your R&D arm. So if you're a small business, you don't have an R&D component of your company, well, hey, the university could do that. And it doesn't necessarily require you to have a, a, a funded research relationship with the the university, it might be that you're serving on a graduate student's committee and you deconflict yourself, you don't have a conflict of interest, but you're providing a private sector perspective on the work that they're doing. And you might involve uh, them doing an internship in your company for maybe not a lot of money, but all of a sudden then you're able to hire them because you've vetted them. You know exactly their capabilities, you've developed their capabilities, and all of a sudden they're your employee. And so you've, you've not made a huge investment in them, you've reaped the benefits of being at the university. That's, I think, the power of the local economic development. I think the key thing is to have the university not see itself in competition with the local economic development authorities. You want to have a partnership to where you say the university plays an important role, the, the uh, Chamber of Commerce plays an important role, a lot of times there's economic development organizations that play a role. We at, in o at Oklahoma and Norman, we have a triumvirate of those things and they all work together. If somebody comes to the campus, great. If they don't come to the campus, great. If they're in Norman or they're nearby, we call that a win. So I, it's, it's about, I think, being a a good partner in this and not wanting to have everything for yourself, but growing with a community in mind, as you say. My district consists of um, rural parts of Western Illinois, um, smaller suburban areas. Um, we know that smaller universities uh, tend to attract much less funding. Um, we have to make sure that more funding gets to smaller schools. What policies can Congress install to ensure that a diverse set of universities get a their funding, their piece of that funding pie. I'll, I'll give this to anyone. Well, I'll just tell you one thing that NSF is doing. It's got a new program called Granted. It stands for, if I get this right, Growing Research Access for Nationally Transformative Equity and Diversity. And the idea basically is to say that small universities, small colleges, they, they have the capability to compete in terms of their personnel, but they don't have the administrative structures to, to manage grants, to do proposal submissions, to meet all the compliance rules and regulations. So the idea is that if we, as a federal government, could invest in that capability through part, helping build partnerships with other institutions, then we empower them to unleash the capabilities of their faculty without putting them in jeopardy of getting an audit report on a grant that they somehow mismanaged without any ill intent, but they simply didn't have the people who knew what they were doing and they weren't used to doing it, they didn't have a history. So that kind of program, which is not super expensive, uh, it's, it's leveraging the existing capabilities at R1 and R2 schools to build an ecosystem of partnerships of administering grant proposals and grant awards once they're funded. That will really empower a lot of institutions. Thank you. I'm out of time. I yield back. We now recognize the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Tenney. Uh, thank you, Chairman Issa and the ranking member for holding this important meeting on U.S.-China competitiveness. And thank you to the witnesses for your time and insight. Looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, New York's new 24th Congressional District has a history as the home to the Erie Canal, which is one of the first regions in our country to enter and successfully prosper during the Industrial Revolution. However, unfortunately, in upstate New York, and it's particularly my region along the canal, uh, we've suffered tremendously as we'd allow, we've allowed China to flood our markets with cheap, subsidized products. We've lost jobs. We've lost companies. Uh, so many have been displaced, so many iconic names that people uh, would recognize, such as Oneida, such as uh, IBM and other, country, uh, other uh, big contributors. Um, but over the last few decades, the rise of the malign influence of the Chinese Communist Party harmed Americans as it was 
its stated, uh, its state-sponsored espionage efforts have stolen American intellectual property. I believe it's over 600 billion now on an annual basis. And its unfair trade tactics have driven American industries out of business. Uh, additionally, China continues to spread its greater economic position to spread its techno-authoritarian model abroad, uh, all across the world, actually. While the federal government invests heavily in research and development, private businesses must r roughly invest three times uh, as much annually into research and development. To stay at the forefront of new emerging industries, the federal government must ensure its effort complements those in the private sector and not hurts them. Uh, this can be achieved through rewarding organizations with a good track record of successfully commercializing technologies uh, and through proven policies, including the R&D tax credit. Uh, I want to first direct my, my first question to Ms. Wynne Smith. So in your testimony that was, was given, you discussed the troubling concentration of science and technology investments in coastal hubs like Silicon Valley. This leaves large swaths of our country in important industries, such as manufacturing, uh, without access to the capital they need to innovate and thrive, particularly where I, I am, I'm from. So my first question for you is, from your perspective, how can we leverage the National Science and Technology Plan to geographically diversify investments in science and technology and bring them to our rural regions, particularly upstate New York, which gets often forgotten between Buffalo and New York City? Thank you, Congresswoman. Well, we've had some discussion on that, and, and I know your region very well. And one thing I would say is the extent to which in our large-scale partnerships that we have, funded by NSF, Department of Energy, we might think of having some kind of a provision where we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion of people and talent, but we ought to think of that also mm -hmm. geographically so that every big project would also reach out and include an institution from a different part of the country that would have some compatible resources. I'll give you another example, and, and uh, Dr. Budell could really talk to this better than I, but I know when Kodak had its difficulties mm -hmm. in Rochester, the whole optics workforce they had, the best in the world, many of those people came to Livermore to, to, to build NIFT. So the mobility we have of people is one thing, but at the end of the day, it's really creating the environment for companies that want to come and invest there and also grow. I mean, I know Micron just has a new facility in New York that they've come in, and maybe also, you know, the old idea of incentives, tax breaks and things, there's a little outdated, but there are other types of incentives that states and regions can, can give for locating um, in their facilities. And the trained talent's huge wouldn't, for that. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree uh, that incentives would be better than having ma uh, sort of mandates and set-asides? Oh, yes, and, yes. Because I, you, you get me now, concerned I, when you yeah. mention DEI and, and the fact that we have a, a state that's very hostile to businesses and incentivizing. That's why we don't have Kodak, Bausch & Lomb, Xerox, all those, all from the Rochester region, you know, have left for better uh, better tax treatment, better opportunities, and, and access to capital, actually. So uh, let me ask you, so you, in your uh, competing in the next economy report, you talk about the importance of breathing life in declining U.S. regional economies by stemming the brain dream, injecting high skills, and raising innovation potential. Can you tell me specifically, not including a DEI-type scenario, that you would, uh, how do you address those in our rural communities? We have wonderful people who work, farmers, people who've been displaced uh, because of the, the, the growing difficulty in, you know, for example, farming in upstate New York, even though my district is the number one dairy and ag district in the entire Northeast, uh, but we need help. How would you do that in Hardison? Well, I first want to clarify when I was talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, I was specifically meaning geographical and regional that we have all regions of the country included, and there are ways you know, to do that. In terms of the work of the Council on Competitiveness, what we're going to be doing is anchoring a lot of this with universities in the regions, community colleges, four-year college, and on, and have them be kind of the anchor in helping to de develop this with workforce boards and economic development agencies, and also identify the leadership networks in these regions. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of wealth still in that part of New York. Are they investing? Are they supporting startups and things? So we're going to look at these. I mean, there's a lot of knowledge to learn because we, nobody has the recipe for this yet. If we did, we wouldn't be having this conversation, but it's an imperative. If I may for one minute, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, we very, do very have, quickly. We do have the highest taxes in the nation, on, not California anymore. So that's a big problem, which is why I do support the tax incentives, especially in places like New York, where there really is no place to 
get relief other than the federal side. But we appreciate your comments. I Thank apologize you. my time has run out. Thank you. We now Thank recognize you. the gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Foshi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for being here um, today. This topic is particularly relevant to North Carolina's 4th Congressional District, which is home to several federally funded research centers and projects, including the Triangle University's Nuclear Laboratory, the North Carolina Biotechnology Center, um, North Carolina Central University's Biomanufacturing Research Institute, and technology enterprise known as BRIGHT, and the UNC Collaborative Sciences Center for Road Safety, just to name a few. And additionally, um, our world class research universities and the Research Triangle Park, a premier global innovation center and the nation's largest research park, home to nearly 400 companies and over 60,000 employees. So I am particularly encouraged by the promise uh, that our region holds for innovation and in enhancing our nation's global competitiveness in science and technology. Today, I would like to talk with you about how we can leverage our nation's regional strengths, given our success so far throughout North Carolina, as an example of what can be achieved when we bring together local and state governments um, with corporate, nonprofit, and university partners. So my first question is for Dr. Um, Drogemeyer and Ms. Wes Smith. In your provided testimonies, you mentioned the importance of regional innovation and partnerships, um, a key component included in the CHIPS and Science Act. And I'm wondering if you can briefly highlight the opportunities and some possible challenges facing regional innovation. You, you've said it so beautifully in terms of the importance of, of regional partnerships and with, with Research Triangle Park and Research Triangle Institute and the, the extraordinary resources you have there. Still, North Carolina is a rural state, right? And there's a lot of folks in North Carolina that need to be brought, uh, brought to the table. Um, partnerships take a lot of different uh, forms and the reason you do partnerships is really because you need help in doing something that you can't do on your own, frankly. And there's, there's probably another reason where you say you want to you lift up others who basically have been disadvantaged for a variety of reasons or, or whatever. Um, when I was at the White House, I realized through a variety of, of meetings we had that although a lot of federal agencies have partnership offices, um, <clears throat> we don't really do partnerships very well. And people were, were realizing, oh, we, we could do much better. Uh, I think that's true for, for universities, it's true for, uh, for basically uh, all the sort of key players in a state, that they have their own swim lanes, as, as Deborah said earlier, uh, but the economic development folks don't talk to the workforce development folks. And, and it seems so surprising and so simple, but getting them together and looking at the, the broad plan is, is really the key thing. And I think what the national S&T strategy provides an opportunity to do is to have that conversation and confront the difficult challenge that we have of not knowing what all we have and not knowing who's not talking to who. And um, it's not really the government's job to do the work, it's the government's job to bring the people together. And frankly, I think the private sector is better positioned than the government to structure those conversations. I'm not saying in terms of OSDP, but I'm saying in terms of having software and capabilities to bring people together, to find these creative differences, to find the, the folks that aren't in the game, to how do we get them to the table. Um, that really is the key, in my view, of, of building these, these partnerships and creating the broader community that will uplift the, the rural communities that have so much to offer, but they're just not in the game now because they don't have the resources. And that's what this plan, if we do it right, I think will give us the roadmap for how to do it. And I know Deborah, I'm sure, has some thoughts. I, I would just add, uh, Congresswoman, that North Carolina is a, a poster child of success. And many parts of the country look at North Carolina, how, you know, the, the, that whole um, Research Triangle Park, the great universities, mm -hmm. the economy developed. And one thing also on the leadership issue, we're very uh, inspired, active governors. I remember some years ago working with Governor Hunt, and that was kind of his focus. And another example going on right now is in Tennessee, where the governor is working very, very closely with Oak Ridge National Lab, with both, all the universities, including the smaller ones and community colleges, and the new companies that are beginning to look at that area as a center place for battery manufacturing in the EV revolution.
yield back? Thank you. We now go to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just have uh, hopefully very short questions. Um, Dr. Bodel in particular, I look forward to supporting you in your, in your fusion work, um, near and dear to my heart. Um, just one question though, is there any public investment that you believe would yield fu fusion on the grid by 2032 in the time, in the 10 year time frame? Thank you for your support and thank you for the question. Um, it really is true that the sort of x-axis, how long till fusion energy on the grid is a function of investment. That's public investment as well as private investment. Uh, and which technology path you pursue. So there are significant efforts on magnetic fusion and growing efforts in inertial confinement fusion energy approaches today. It's a little bit early days for us to say whether there's a, a plan that will get you there in 10 years. Uh, but it's certainly true that the level of investment would need to be significantly larger to galvanize that kind of effort. There's a lot of intellectual capital that's interested in pursuing this. Students are really uh, energized by fusion prospects. There's a lot of private capital on the table. Uh, and unfortunately, the uh, investment in fusion energy uh, demonstration uh, is still early days. Should we be making policy decisions about our energy mix anticipating, expecting, planning, and depending on fusion on the grid by 2032? I think you always have to plan for the future energy mix with uh, what we would characterize as an uncertainty band, because there are a whole host of technologies that can contribute that are at varying degrees of maturity. And so I was certainly wouldn't put all my eggs in any one basket. There are technologies that are mature today that can contribute to a sustainable energy mix in 10 years, and there are nascent technologies like fusion that have the potential, uh, although the next few years will be critical, to determine what that timeline really looks like. So I'm a, I'm a fan of all of the above, really trying to think about all the tools we have in our toolkit to ensure the U.S. has a sustainable, uh, economically viable energy sector. Um, thank you. Ms. Um, Weiss smith uh, you mentioned uh, dual-use technologies, do you mind uh, clarifying, if you, if you were to provide a definition of dual use, what comes to your mind? From the very inception, they have both commercial and military applications. And increasingly, all the technologies we've been talking about in this hearing that are reshaping the world have that, you know, uh, Putin said some years ago, whoever controls and leads an AI will control the world. She has given the list of these. and. You know, you see, I mean, I, I, I should mention this example. You know, we're talking about university research and the Chinese. One of the major universities in Australia, one of the centers of quantum work, had four Chinese researchers who all turned out to be from the PLA. If, if I may, I just... So that's um, a serious issue on dual I'll, use. I'll, I'll be advancing a letter to, uh, to other members to prioritize uh, DOE spending um, and research, in particular, for dual use technologies. We have to meet our civilian commitments, but there's things like uranium enrichment, tritium production, upon which fusion relies that also have uh, military use, and so that we should prioritize those. Um, thank you. Um, Dr. Kelvin, just because that's easier to pronounce, I apologize. Um, so my mother went to OU for, uh, for a year, and my uh, uncle was a uh, got his PhD there in, in civil engineering and was a professor there in Norman. Um, you know, years ago. Uh, there's a few things in your comments, um, in your opening comments. Do you think we need a 20-year plan uh, similar to China's for our national uh, technology policy? Well, I think the, the four-year timeline for the, the S&T strategy is, is good. Four or five years seems right. I don't know that I call it a 25-year plan or 20-year plan, but I'd say we need a 25-year look ahead or a 20-year look ahead within to set the context for that five-year plan. Thank right. you. Um, should government direct industry involvement like China, uh, sorry, industry investment like China, should our government be having the same kind of heavy hand that, uh, that China has in directing investment? No, I don't believe so. Um, <clears throat> Would you say that our American system is inherently uncompetitive relative to the Chinese model? Is it for me? Yes. No, I would say it's, it's highly competitive um, because of our freedoms to create and so on. As we heard earlier, 
China in, uh, does most of its work in applied R&D, and they're basically reaping the benefits of our investments in fundamental research. They're improving their fundamental research, but that's really the seed corn of everything that follows. So I think we're very innovative. I think we're very competitive, but we have to maintain that competitive position. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. We now recognize the gentlelady from Colorado, Ms. Caraveo. Uh, thank you, Chairman Lucas and Ranking Member Bonamici for today's hearing, uh, my first Science Committee hearing um, ever, and it looks like I might be closing it out. Um, to our panel of witnesses, thank you so much for joining us. You know, our science agencies do a wonderful job of partnering with academic scientists to generate scientific discoveries and, importantly, to help train the next generation of STEM students. In my district, for example, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology has a partnership with the University of Colorado at Boulder that places undergraduates, graduate students and postdoctoral researchers in federal labs to gain important hands-on experience alongside um, NIST scientists. I know that the CHIPS and Science Act help broaden opportunities such as these at many of our science agencies, but I think that there's still more that we can do. Um, so Dr. Uh, Boudel, can you talk about your experiences with university partnerships at Lawrence Livermore National Lab and the importance of partnerships between national labs and universities to expand STEM opportunities? Yes, thank you very much for the question. Our partnerships with academic institutions are essential. They really are the lifeblood of our laboratory, and they bring new ideas, new people, new energy, new enthusiasm into our environment every day. And I would say, I think about partnerships with universities across the full spectrum. So we work with uh, community college partners, we work with four-year universities, we work with large R1 universities, we work locally and we work um, across the U.S. with a wide variety of institutions. Uh, institutions that have specific skills and, and focus disciplinary research in areas that are really important to us. So we try to do several things in those partnerships. We try to build enduring relationships with faculty members who have important uh, expertise or research lines. We teach them about our work. We give them access to our facilities. We work in close partnership with them. So it's not a one and done transactional send me your student and and uh, uh, those research partnerships really keep that connective tissue alive between us and these many institutions. And then we work to bring a wide variety of students across many disciplines into our environment, both on an enduring basis. We have many students who do, for example, their PhD research at the laboratory, uh, but large scale summer programs are particularly important where students get to come and spend several months, as you said, working in a real laboratory or with real computational specialists and understanding what it means to be a scientist. Uh, we also do outreach at earlier ages to really introduce younger students, high school age and younger, to what science looks like and how much fun science is. And I really do uh, love seeing my early career staff in particular go out into these institutions and the joy they bring, the, the commitment they have to our important missions and the research that we do, but the gift it is to be able to work in these disciplines really advancing the state of, state of the art. So university partnerships are foundational to everything we do. You know, coming from medicine, I know how important it is for workforce development to have hands-on um, experience. Uh, so thank you very much for those programs that you run. Uh, Dr. Drogmeyer, um, in your testimony, you discussed the need to coordinate workforce development on a national scale. What opportunities do you think exist to leverage federal labs and university par partnerships to get more STEM-capable students into the workforce? And how can the national science and technology strategy leverage these partnerships? Well, thank you so much for the question. I think it's, it's absolutely vital because those are existing like the, the 17 DOE national labs, which are absolutely our crown jewel. Uh, and all the NOAA laboratories, the NIST laboratories that you have in Boulder, uh, they are exceptionally capable. They have wonderful people uh, that, you know, researchers, and so on. Uh, we need to, to leverage what we already have. And, and when we do that, we're actually getting a, a one plus one equals five kind of proposition versus building a lot of new stuff. By linking existing, quote, stuff together, we can get a, really a multiplicative factor. Um, and if I come back to the point that Dr. Bedell made, um, and you're, you're a health person, in, in, in Boulder and also in Oklahoma, what we did was we took a page out of the playbook of medicine. We said, if you bring together operational people, you bring together research and education, like the teaching hospital concept, you've got all three together to leverage one another. You've got federal operations folks, you've got federal researchers, you've got academic researchers, you've got the education piece. 
it works well in the teaching hospital, and Boulder did that, and we did it, and it works well. Now it's, you know, it's not replicable everywhere because there aren't necessarily federal operations, but there is a lot of them out there. And if you think of that model as being another model for partnerships, it's something we could really leverage in the S&T uh, strategy. Thank you both so much. I yield back my time. Thank you. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Keene, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and thank you to the panel for being here today and helping educate us um, on, on the issues facing um, this country and this committee. Um, I come from the 7th Congressional District in New Jersey. I would argue it's the uh, most innovative uh, district in the, in the country between life sciences, information technology, manufacturing, many other um, thought leaders. Um, many other countries, uh, Ms. Winsmith, um, have introduced more tax and other incentive policies, including modeling their technology transfer policies after those in the United States. How important is it that we continue to foster continued public-private partnerships? And what are some of the areas where the U.S. leads the world and that we cannot afford to lose? Thank you, Congressman, for that question. Um, I think our public-private partnerships are absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. And I think it also goes to the character of our nation, that we have always been a people that sees opportunities by working mm -hmm. outside of our, our comfort zone, as it were. We've mm -hmm. seen that since we were pioneers and coming to this country. So it's essential. And quite frankly, our technology transfer legislation that goes back to the 1980s and the Bayh-Dole and all of those, those acts and their regulatory acts that were implemented by Congress had played a huge role in helping us to commercialize technology with the private sector. And I will say in my work, countries around the world are always coming and wanting to study, how do you do these partnerships? They, they know about them, but they really don't know the secret sauce of what goes into it. Mm -hmm. And I think we've all been talking about that during the day. So. Um, I think it's very exciting, yes, with limited resources, but huge opportunities that we leverage them because we're not going to get ahead in advanced semiconductors beyond Moore's Law or the battery futures, the biotech, the frontiers, you know, in your state without these public-private partnerships that involve business, academia, our national labs, and our workforce, including labor. So they are absolutely essential. And I, I agree with you in, in that regard, and there's state and then there's federal policy in both areas to create so really the, the, uh, the creative ecosystem for that. Um, or what should we be doing to improve those relationships? Well, I think one of the ways to improve those relationships is always to understand the transparency that's involved in them, and also that the partners have sometimes different priorities and different time horizons. You know, an academic researcher has a much longer time framework than someone working at a national lab that has a development component and a mission. And then, of course, business, they really are operating under, you know, quarterly earnings, investors who say, if you don't have your product out there, we're finished with you. So how you meld all those together to advance is not trivial. Um, and that's a challenge, I think, to continue the, to work on. Thank you. Thank you to you and to the panel. Uh, I yield back my time. You know, uh, a change in the geopolitical picture in just the last 30 days has really transformed uh, the importance and significance of your expertise and testimony. And uh, the, the, not only the questioning, but the answers that you provided um, could, in fact, have uh, historical importance in the years and decades to come. So I really want to thank each one of you for your exceptional uh, expertise and contribution. It's personally near and dear to me. I've spent much of the last 18 years in innovation working with tech transfer offices in uh, my career in the nuclear Navy, um, which was very short. Uh, but it's, uh, I really do value and appreciate uh, all your different perspectives. So I thank you for your time. I thank also my colleagues and members for their questions. The record will remain open for 10 days for additional written comments and written questions from members. And this hearing is adjourned.